The Valiant, Star Legend, Book One, written and narrated by J. J. Green. Chapter Twenty Three. The patient had shaken off the last effects of sedation and was fit to be discharged from the sick bay. But Wright had no idea what to do with him. Thanks to Ellis, he was no longer aggressive, and he even had civilian clothes to wear from the Valiant's printers. Wright thought he could probably find a small cabin for him, but then what? They were preparing for battle, and even if they weren't, the notion of the mystery man hanging out with the Marines was crazy. It was obvious he wasn't B.A. military or CIS. The distress signal was unexplained, but his rescue had clearly been a mistake. He could only be a local who had somehow become trapped in the cave. It was only by a huge amount of luck he'd been saved from certain death. The Valiant was no longer in her former high Earth orbit when attempting to return him to SBI might have been an option. She was now far beyond the home planet as the Navy and Marines gathered forces for an assault. Wright looked at the patient sitting quietly on the edge of his bed. He resented the burden of responsibility for the man when he had so many more important things to do. Can you tell him we won't be able to return him to West Bi just yet? He asked Ellis. That he'll have to stay aboard until after the battle. She looked at him like he'd asked her to levitate. How am I supposed to do that? It isn't that hard, is it? Just explain in your language, Major. He doesn't speak my language. Huh? How did you calm him down earlier? He must have liked my singing. I did ask him if he spoke Welsh, but he didn't understand me. But you've been talking to him all this time. Ellis had been keeping up a monologue, talking to the patient ever since they'd released him from the restraints. In truth, Wright had enjoyed listening to her melodic native tongue, though he couldn't understand a word of it. Only because it seemed to soothe him, he's been through a lot, sir. No wonder he reacted violently when he woke up. He must have thought he was dying in that cave, and then he found himself aboard a starship among strangers. Must have been a hell of a shock. Yeah, Wright reached for an interface. Well, we can soon solve the translation problem. He opened the relevant software and turned the mic to face the patient. Can you get him to say something? Ellis touched the man's arm and spoke again in Welsh. He answered graciously, his voice soft and deep, and he inclined his head in a slight bow. Then he eyed the interface. Wright checked the screen. Language not identified. Try again," he said to the corporal. Ellis spoke once more. Her mother language contained unfamiliar sounds, which Wright thought he'd heard the patient make too. Yet now he observed them more closely. It was clear neither understood the other. When the man replied this time, he spoke for longer, and the interface captured twenty or thirty seconds of speech. That should have been plenty for the software to pinpoint the language. But when Wright looked at the screen again, it repeated the same message. "I don't get it," he said. Ellis also peered at the interface. "It isn't that weird, is it? He must speak a rare language. The banks contain every human language spoken today and for the last five hundred years. It isn't possible for the software not to recognize it. Maybe it's got a bug. Maybe," Wright repeated. Though he doubted it, a medic strolled out from the staff office. "Don't forget these," she said. She was carrying a small plastic bag, which she handed to the patient. "We dumped his rags," she added to Wright. "I hope that was okay." "Sure, great. If you need anything, let me know." The man was examining the plastic, rubbing it between his fingertips. After apparently satisfying his curiosity, he opened the bag and took out his arm and neck torques. Whoa! Ellis breathed. Can I take a look? She asked, holding out her hand. The man passed her the neck torque. It's so heavy! She exclaimed. Turning the thick gold band over, she looked closely at the intricate design. It must be pure gold, said Wright. 
recalling his first sight of the strange jewellery. He wondered where the man had gotten it from. Perhaps he'd found it when he'd wandered into the cave. Look, this is the same as one of his tattoos. Ellis showed him the animal that pranced around one curve of the talk. I think this is a deer, but this... I'm not sure. Wait, I know what this is. It's a dragon. Wright regarded the animal that curved around the other side of the talk, the open, fanged mouth spurting flames and the wings sprouting from a serpentine body. A dragon? he asked. How do you know? The creature was only vaguely familiar to him. All he knew was it was mythical, not real or even extinct. They were in the old stories my granddad used to tell me. The corporal passed the talk back to the man, looking thoughtful. The patient slid his armband over his shirt sleeve and put the dragon talk around his neck. Ellis watched him for several long moments. Then, as if on impulse, she took one of his hands in both of hers. The man didn't object. It was as though an unspoken exchange was going on between them. What is it, Corporal? asked Wright. I... I can't say. I wish I could talk to him. What can't you say? Do you know who this man is? Where he's from? No. Or at least not with any certainty. I guess it doesn't really matter. Wherever he's from, we can't take him back right now. I wish I knew how he managed to send that distress signal, though. Wright felt a yawn forcing its way up from his chest. He'd been on duty for 36 hours, preparing for the forthcoming battle, and he needed to get some sleep. Let's find him a room. Maybe you can teach him how to use the entertainment system. I want him occupied and out of the way. Do you think you can make him understand he can't leave his cabin? I can try, sir. OK, let's go. Come on, buddy. Wright stood up. Sir, can I stay in his room with him? asked Ellis. I could look after him and keep him out of trouble. Maybe teach him English. Absolutely not. Your orders are to support the training sessions. Isn't it too late for that now? How long do we have until we reach the rendezvous? Probably not more than 24 hours, Wright conceded. Then there's no more training for a while. Everyone will be getting battle ready. They should be. But so should you. I will. And keep an eye on him. I can do both. Ellis's demeanour had changed over the few hours she'd been helping to deal with the mystery man. The surliness, argumentativeness and acrimony were gone and had been replaced by the eager, alert, gutsy attitude from Wright's first encounter with her. Something about the patient had changed her. In her new frame of mind, she could be an invaluable asset. Sir, she said, interrupting his train of thought, I hope you don't mind me asking, but is everything OK with you? Wright frowned. I'm fine, thank you, Corporal. It's just that ever since Colburn got back, you've changed. Like something's gnawing at you. Your concern is unwarranted, Ellis, he said icily. Who did she think she was? Returning to the question on his mind, he mused Colburn would probably have something to say about giving the corporal new duties other than the ones she had assigned. On the other hand, she would be too busy to notice right now. He decided in this case it would be better to ask forgiveness than permission. All right, he said. He's your responsibility until you get the order to suit up. Chapter 24 When Taylor learned exactly what the BA had planned in retaliation for the assault on the Caribbean territory, she was deeply troubled. She'd joined up imagining she would be fighting the EAC military and possibly the APs too. What she hadn't envisioned was attacking civilians. Whether or not she agreed with the aims of the Antarctic project, she didn't think the people involved in it deserved to suffer for choosing that path in their lives. 
She was sure that, like her, they only wanted what they felt was best for them and their families, even if the AP's methods were questionable. But she was on track to take part in the fight, whether she liked it or not. The only other option was to refuse and, at that point and place in time, her objection would result in being spaced. The BA wouldn't tolerate a dissenter on one of their ships in the midst of a battle. And she needed to survive. She had more people to worry about than just herself. At least she could occupy her time in the hours leading up to the battle, looking after the mysterious patient. She watched the strange man walk around the small cabin Wright had found for him, examining every object closely. He looked under the bunk, pressed the mattress, ran his fingertips over the blank interface on the wall, jumping in surprise when it sprang to life, opened the drawers in the desk and even touched the overhead, apparently intrigued by the light that emanated from it. He stepped into the small square box that comprised the restroom. To her amusement, what interested him most was the head. She didn't think he understood what it was for, so she flushed it. He leapt higher than he had when he opened the interface. The shower similarly baffled him. She wasn't sure how to explain how to use the head, but she turned on the shower as a demonstration. The man laughed apparently partly in shock and partly in delight. She laughed too and reached into the cubicle to allow the water to run over her hand before wiping it on her face. She beckoned him to come closer and then took his wrist and pushed his hand into the stream. The look of delight on his face was so childlike it was funny. He rubbed the water on his beard. That's right, it's for washing, see? She wet her hand again and rubbed her neck. Then she mimed taking off her clothes and stepping into the shower. Understanding lit the man's eyes. He pretended to take off his shirt and wash his chest, smiling. Yeah, Taylor nodded. He held his hand under the water, appearing to enjoy the feel of it. She was enjoying herself too. For the first time since that bitch Colburn had ripped Kayla's necklace from her neck, she felt normal, light-hearted even, despite the shadow of the upcoming battle. The cloud of bitterness and anger had lifted. Assuming they survived, helping this man was going to be fun. She decided she would find Boots and bring him to the cabin. He could be the man's companion while she was on duty. He pretended to take off his shirt again, but this time he mimed washing it in the water. Ha <laughs> ha! No, no need for that. She walked to the laundry chute and opened it. You put your dirty clothes in here. She returned to the shower. Better turn this off. Mustn't waste water. Come here. She stepped back into the cabin. You get top rack, she said patting the upper bunk. I'll sleep down below. I hope you don't snore. She pointed at herself and then the lower bunk. That's if we get a chance to sleep. How to tell him they were about to engage in a battle? It would be impossible. She guessed he would figure it out when the fighting started. What would happen to him then? It might be best to lock him in his cabin until it was all over. Hey, this is crazy, she said. I don't even know your name. Let's begin your first English lesson. She touched her chest. My name is Taylan. Taylan, she repeated, emphasising the syllables. Can you say that? Taylan. She pointed at his mouth. The man's brow wrinkled. Taylan. That's great. Talon, she patted her chest again. Talon, said the man. Next, she gently tapped his chest. Who are you? What are you called? He replied with a name that caused all the strength in her legs to evaporate and shock to radiate through her. She managed to slide onto the lower bunk. It couldn't be. 
Ever since Wright had told her about the strange person he'd rescued from the cave in West B.I., someone who appeared to have survived for an impossible length of time, and ever since she'd seen the man's talks with their carvings of beasts and dragons, she'd been harbouring a wild speculation about who he might be. But she wasn't the kind of person who believed in ghosts, fairy tales or even the ancient mythologies of her homeland. To her, they were all stories for entertainment and part of the culture and heritage she was proud of, but they weren't fact. She'd never believed in any of the people or creatures of the ancient legends. She'd never thought they actually existed. It wasn't possible. The man was watching her with concern. He sat down next to her and said something in his own language. You can't be, she protested. She must have misheard. Her mind was playing tricks on her. The man was speaking a foreign language in an unfamiliar accent and her imagination must have inserted another word in place of the one he'd actually said. She decided to try again. I'm Talon. She touched her chest and felt her heart pounding against her breastbone. Fearing the worst, and not exactly sure what the worst would be, what would it mean if it really was him? She pointed at the man. He repeated the name she'd heard before. No, no, no! It had to be a mistake, or something to do with his pronunciation. Or it was only a coincidence. That was it. A coincidence. Red alert! Red alert! sounded her comm. Enemy ships approaching. Battle stations. Chapter 25 The Belladonna fired. Pulse bolts spurted from her cannon and sped across space. Dwyer Orr sat on the flagship's bridge, thrilled by the chase. The dreadnought was leading the EAC formation, the tip of a four-sided spearhead. Spreading out behind the ship in four lines came the rest of the fleet. The AP's battleships approached from another direction, racing to meet the enemy. Carla recalled the Belladonna's launch ceremony, the blessing, the breaking of the bottle of champagne, the celebratory rituals, the post-launch party. It had been a wonderful moment and a milestone in the history of the EAC. She loved the ship's sleek lines and powerful armaments, including a particle lance and pulse and plasma cannon, but her pleasure was bittersweet. She also longed for the day when she wouldn't need starships or weapons, when the crusade would unlock the secrets of the universe and harness its natural power. When that happened, she would assert control of the solar system and habitable planets of the galaxy and return everything to its natural order. Direct hits, reported the weapons officer. But the Belladonna's pulses evaporated on the hulls of the BA corvettes, causing no apparent damage. The distance remained too great, most of the bolt's energy dissipating into space before they reached their target. However, the EAC was closing the gap. Carla smirked, imagining the dismay of the BA's commanding officers now they understood their plan had been leaked and they were flying into a trap. The Belladonna's captain, a small, dark-haired man, cleared his throat. From the trajectory of their ships, it appears the BA is heading for the Brez, not the Balor, as we thought, Dwyer. Then we change the intercept point. I'll inform Ua Talman in case he doesn't already know. The navigator is already working on it. The captain looked uncomfortable for a moment, then added, I believe your boy is aboard the Brez. He is? And? I just want to reassure you I'll do everything in my power to ensure he's unharmed. Thank you, but your assurances aren't required. In response to the captain's puzzled silence, Carla went on, the fact that the BA intends to attack the Brez isn't bad news. It only means they never stood a hope. Perrin is the future of the EAC. He is inviolable. His presence will protect the colony ship. 
The same as mine protects the Belladonna. The captain inclined his head. We are fortunate to have you aboard. Was there a tinge of irony in his response? It didn't matter. When she'd revealed the EAC's deepest beliefs about undiscovered physical laws to Ur Talman, she'd noticed a similar attitude of disbelief and perhaps amusement. But she hadn't taken offence. Most of the people she met were ignorant, blind children when it came to the truth. They could only see what lay before them and clung to simple Newtonian ideas about how nature worked. The captain didn't need to believe her, only follow her orders. One day, Lorcan and the other doubters would see how right she was. She got up and strode to the captain's hollow screen, which displayed an ever-changing vista of the ships involved in the battle. Fire again! But I know the range is still too long. I want to harry them. Naturally, the captain didn't want to expend the Belladonna's finite power capacity unnecessarily, but there was more to a battle than trading hits. I want them to understand they have no hope. On the hollow screen, the AP vessels crawled upward from the bottom left. The BA had to have noticed their second enemy by now. The captain gave the order and four bolts of pure energy tore from the flagship's cannon. The BA Admiral had to be assessing the ships bearing down on them and their firepower. He had to know the battle was already lost. The BA was outgunned and, with two adversaries flying in from separate regions of space, it was soon to be outmanoeuvred. She expected some attempt at defence and then a quick surrender. They would try to save the lives of their men and women. The Alliance was losing ground on Earth and now it would lose its dominance in space. Again, she said. Fire! This time, as the pulses streamed toward the BA fleet, the corvettes, trailing the bigger ships, returned fire. The bolts collided with the belladonnas, exploding in bursts of energy. Finally, a response. The BA was fighting back, deluded, imagining it might still win. Or did it only want to make it through to the Brez and destroy the ship as a last act of defiance? Their fighter ships are launching, the captain warned. Carla nodded, satisfied. She would enjoy the fight. I'll leave the tactics to you from now on, Captain. I'll liaise with Ua Talman as the battle progresses. You know the overall strategy. Thank you, Dwyer. She returned to her seat and opened a direct comm to Lorcan. You were right, was the first thing he said, after a lag. That's gracious of you to admit, said Carla. I told you my sources were reliable. Did you doubt it? Perhaps a little, it's wise to be circumspect. I've been trying and failing for years to infiltrate the BA and, to be frank, I couldn't quite believe they would be so bold as to attempt to attack my colony vessels. They want to hit you where it hurts, said Carla. Losing one of your ships would be a huge setback and a heavy blow to your people's morale. She heard the captain's orders to the weapons officer, the Belladonna was now sufficiently within range of the BA fleet for their hits to count. You don't need to tell me that, said Lorcan. But now they know we're one step ahead. That's got to unsettle them. Do you know they're targeting the Brez, not the Balor? My source got that wrong. Perhaps a last-minute change of mind, said Lorcan. The substance of the intel was accurate, and without it the BA might have succeeded. I would have been hard put to muster an adequate defence in time. I'm glad I accepted your proposal to work together. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, Carla replied. It's an old saying, but true nonetheless. Now I know your capabilities, I would rather be your friend than your enemy, Dwyer. She smiled at the flattery. A wise sentiment, Ua Talman. 
Unfortunately, anyone who stands in the way of the EAC will eventually be my enemy, and one day you will be an obstacle, not a means to an end. A collective shout from the officers on the Belladonna's bridge went up, distracting Carla from her conversation. She lifted her head and saw a spray of fine sparks across the hollow screen, the traces of a BA ship disintegrating. Looking closer, she realised they'd destroyed one of the little corvettes. I have a battle to direct, Dweer, said Lorcan. Forgive me if I end our chat for now. I'll update you on developments. The AP fleet was now coming within firing range of the BA. As Carla watched, it began its attack. The AP's battleships were closest to the leading BA vessels, their destroyers, dreadnoughts and battlecruisers. The Alliance had certainly gone all out in this attack, throwing most of what they had at the AP. And, despite the discovery of their plan and the combined assault by both its enemies, the BA appeared to be pushing through regardless, attempting to reach the Brez and destroy her no matter what damage their ships sustained in the attempt. Murmurs of support for the AP went around the bridge as everyone who wasn't watching a console fixed their attention on the hollow screen. The project ships didn't appear to be holding anything back as they rained hell on the BA. The larger ships of the Alliance's fleet were better equipped to endure the onslaught than the corvettes the EAC had been targeting and they were returning fire on a similar scale. A second BA ship fell Victim to the EAC's pulses, a roar of jubilation exploded on the bridge and Carla leapt to her feet in joy. Two ships gone! Though they were only corvettes, that had to be a massive blow to the Alliance. The BA, forced to split its defence between two antagonists, couldn't adequately protect itself from either. The AP ships drew closer to the intercept point where the three fleets' trajectories crossed. It was here the fighting would be heaviest. Carla's stomach twisted in anticipation. At close quarters, the Belladonna could use its particle lance and the effects would be devastating. Swift's launching, someone announced. The BA was sending out its fighter ships, ready for the upcoming close quarters action. Launch scorpions, ordered the captain. As Carla watched, the EAC's fighters flew out to counter the BAs, the tiny dots on the hollow screen moving far faster than the battleships, making them look cumbersome and unwieldy in comparison. She guessed the BA swifts would try to target the Belladonna's engines, set aft behind heavy casing. If they were damaged... The flagship would lose both velocity and power for its weapons, but she was confident the Scorpion pilots would do their job. She returned to her seat again, her excitement ebbing. It didn't appear the BA was anywhere near the point of surrender and the battle could go on for hours. She began to feel detached from the scene on the hollow and everyone around her, Others might not feel as confident as her about victory over the BA fleet, but, as far as she was concerned, the outcome was a foregone conclusion. Now it was only a matter of watching the inevitable play out. The BA offer to surrender would come sooner or later. Lorcan and she had already agreed they would not accept. As Ua Talman had pointed out, Utter annihilation of the BA fleet was the best way to ensure an end to the threat she had mentioned to him. She was fairly confident the man remained aboard one of the Alliance's ships. If they wiped them out entirely and every living thing aboard them, the threat would be destroyed too. In the vacuum of space, everything died. And the BA would never recover from such a defeat it would never control soul space again. Chapter 26 Even at top speed they were half an hour from the Brez and they were already two corvettes down. Wright had watched in horror as first the Daisy and then the Primrose exploded, turned to flying dust by concentrated pulse fire from the EAC ships. Hundreds of men and women dead, 
in a heartbeat. The BA vessels were being picked off one by one, and meanwhile the jaws of the other beast, the AP fleet, awaited them. Ever since he'd heard the BA's objective was to destroy the AP's primary colony ship, he'd thought the scheme was madness. He could understand the thinking behind it. Ua Talman's project wasn't an intellectual or practical endeavour. It was his baby, born of grief and rage. Cutting out its heart might break him. On the other hand, it could push him over the edge, and then who knew what he might do to get his revenge. But now the point was moot. The BA was speeding willingly to its destruction, as Wright saw it, barring a miracle. Colburn paced the bridge, seething. Wright wasn't sure if it was because she held the same opinion as him that they were on a suicide mission, or because she'd been required to give over control of the Valiant to a Royal Navy captain for the duration of the battle. Probably both. The old brigadier marched to and fro, hands clasped behind her back, casting glances at the hollow screen and wincing in displeasure and anger. Launch swifts, said the captain. Colburn turned to right. Units ready to repel borders? Yes, brigadier. It was the third time she'd asked him. The marines had been at battle stations ever since the EAC fleet had been sighted but he guessed her sense of impotence was driving her to distraction. The BA had committed most of its vessels to the attack, keeping only a few in reserve. Where they were, Wright didn't know. He also didn't know if he was luckier to be aboard the Valiant or if he would have been better off on one of the reserve ships. The idea of clinging on after the final defeat of the Alliance disturbed him. Better a quick death than a lingering one. Here she comes, said the captain. The loss of two of her corvettes had attracted the EAC flagship to the Valiant. The massive vessel was ploughing through the swifts like a bear through a cloud of bees, intent on the honey in their hive. There wasn't anything the swift pilots could do about it. EAC scorpions were keeping them occupied, preventing them from getting near the dreadnought. What about the fearless? Colburn asked. But the BA's flagship was leading the charge toward the Brez and had enough troubles of her own, defending herself from the AP's onslaught. We're on our own, the captain replied. But don't worry, we still have our sting. Bring her around, he said to the helm. Aye, captain. What are you doing? asked Colburn. Shouldn't you run this past the admiral? No time. We're fighting for our lives. He can make me face a court-martial when the battle's over, if either of us is still around. Wright braced against a rail as the Valiant swung about. Railgun barrage, as soon as you have her in your sights, the captain said to Newcomb, the weapons officer. The projectile weapon might work against their large attacker. The dreadnought would be slow to move out of the line of fire and her force shield would do nothing against solid titanium. Wright gripped the rail tightly as the sharp movement threatened to throw him off his feet. Finally, the Valiant began to slow as she neared her new position. Shit, no! someone shouted. On the hollow screen, where one of the BA's ships had flown, now there was only a debris field. Which ship? asked Wright. The Resolute, the captain answered grimly. A painful silence descended on the bridge. Wright had had friends aboard the Resolute, one of the BA's newest destroyers, friends from his training days. He felt sick and powerless. He suddenly wondered what he was doing there, on a dubious mission and in a desperate battle. Colburn's confession about the state of things in the upper echelons of the BA had wormed its way into his psyche, making him question everything he had held dear all his life, making him question who he was. Newcomb, said the captain sternly. When you're ready. Yes, sir. The woman refocused on her console. Wright guessed she had known people aboard the vessels they'd lost too. Fuck. Three ships! There were three ships down already, 
and the battle had barely begun. He was seized with the need to do something. He couldn't stand there and watch the destruction of everything he'd held dear for so long. Mom, he said to Colburn, permission to join a unit defending the ship. She looked at him distractedly, as if she hadn't quite heard what he was saying. He realised that, for the first time in his years of serving under the brigadier, he was seeing her on the edge of losing it. He repeated, Permission to, I heard you the first time, she snapped. Permission granted. He set off toward the exit, but before he reached it, someone yelled, What the hell's that? When he turned back, all gazes were on the hollow. He peered at the moving dots, but he couldn't see what was new. He was looking for another enemy vessel joining the battle, but he couldn't see any additional ships. The Valiant shuddered. Her spinal railgun had activated and begun firing, hurling titanium slugs at the EAC dreadnought. What is it? someone asked. Is it a new weapon? Or some kind of ship? Then Wright saw it. Something was heading into the frame of the hollow, and it was moving faster than any space vessel he'd ever seen. But it looked nothing like a weapon or a ship. It was an opaque, amorphous mass, only visible due to the fact it blocked out the light of the stars as it passed in front of them. The scanners aren't picking up a single thing, said Corporal Singh. All they're reading is the light reduction. According to the other data, it doesn't exist. Whatever it is, Colburn said gravely, it isn't ours. No, agreed the captain. It appears to be travelling toward... I think we hit her, exclaimed Newcomb. Yes, said Singh. I'm seeing shrapnel ejected from the EAC flagship starboard bow. Good shot, the captain said. Don't let up. But Wright could see the man remained distracted by the oncoming unknown threat. So was Colburn. She had stopped pacing and was stalking toward the hollow screen, mesmerised. Wright hesitated, now uncertain about his wish to take part in repelling borders. He had a feeling it wouldn't come to that. He had a feeling that EAC and AP would rather destroy the BA ships than acquire them. The mass glided on, heading for the tip of the BA fleet. Due to her manoeuvre to fire upon the EAC dreadnought, the Valiant was hanging back, out of the imminent melee. Her remaining corvette, the Cornflower, flew by her side. What is that thing? murmured Colburn. The Fearless is about to find out, Wright said. He couldn't remove his gaze from the hollow screen, trapped by grim fascination. If the BA Admiral aboard the flagship had noticed the approaching cloud, he hadn't take any evasive action. Until that moment. The Fearless suddenly began to veer off course, leaving the trajectory that would have taken her to the Brez. She was finally trying to avoid the strange mass bearing down on her. Does the Admiral have any information on it? Colburn asked the Captain. If he has, he hasn't transmitted it to the fleet, and I wouldn't want to distract him right now. Er, uh, said Singh, the EAC dreadnought's powering up her particle lance. Damn, the captain said. We've lost two swifts, reported an officer. Divert main power to shields, said the captain. The weapons officer slumped in her seat. The railgun couldn't operate with all the ship's spare power devoted to the shields, but without them they would be cleaved like fruit for the EA ship's dessert. Dear God, whispered Colburn. The baffling mass was reaching out. On the hollow, a finger of darkness was darting across space, moving even faster than the cloud itself. The fearless would never get away from it. The ship was like an ant trying to escape a flash flood. Wright prayed the strange astronomical body was a harmless, directionless object that just happened to be acting like a predatory beast. His prayer went unanswered. The black tongue reached the fearless and wrapped it in shadow. The ship was gone and the entire cloud had vanished too. 
the stars it had blanked out shone again. The mass had disappeared as if it had never existed and taken the BA flagship with it. Chapter 27 The whoops and hollers of her fellow marines echoing in her ears, Talon left her position at the Valiant's aft hatch and went to take off her armour and stow her pulse rifle. She didn't understand what there was to celebrate. Sure, the EAC and AP had backed off, no one seemed to know why, and sure the Alliance had abandoned its suicide mission of destroying the colony ship, but thousands of men and women were dead. The BA had lost four ships, three falling to enemy fire and the fourth disappearing into the ether, swallowed by some kind of cosmic cryptid. Rumour said all contact had been lost with the fearless and the scan data showed no sign of her. From what she'd heard, they'd also lost some swifts. Pre-fight adrenaline still ran like fire through her veins. She was alive with tension, and she didn't know how to come down. Booze was strictly forbidden aboard ship, which wasn't to say it didn't exist, only that she would be risking severe disciplinary action if she was discovered drinking. And after all the stuff she and a batcher had pulled, she couldn't risk it, not if she wanted to remain a marine, and now she thought she did, for a while anyway. She stepped into the armoury, deposited her rifle and began to take off her suit, snapping the helmet clips open and lifting it off her head. She was the first to arrive. Everyone else was still celebrating, not dying. As she pulled out the tabs on each side of her breastplate, releasing it, her rackmate arrived. Hey, said Abacha. Hey. That was some fight we didn't have. She snorted a brief laugh. Yeah. He took off his helmet and slid it into its slot on the wall. She caught him sneaking a glance at her. You doing okay? he asked. Huh? What do you mean? Oh, you know, you've been distracted lately. Have I? Well, I'm fine. She guessed she had been feeling down, but things had changed. How are you doing? I'm good. Same old. Then he said softly, Shame about the daisy. Yeah, a real shame. Talon hadn't been close to her former platoon, but she also felt their loss. Dying in the vacuum of space, alone and maybe wounded, was a possibility she tried not to think about. She guessed everyone aboard BA battleships felt the same. She hoped that whatever had happened to her old shipmates had been quick and painless. If you hadn't put in a request for my transfer to the Valiant along with you, said Abacha, I'd be dead right now. Crap. She paused a beat before removing the rest of her suit. You and me both. You saved my life, said Abacha. Oh, come on. It isn't like I took a bullet for you. And you've been there for me plenty of times. I'm glad you're still around. Glad you're still here too. After all... Who else do I have to beat at Shang-Chi? Talon grinned, walked over to Abacha and punched his shoulder. See you around. You're going? What's your hurry? I thought we could unwind over a game. You never know, I might let you win for once. We both know that's a lie. I'm going to see my new friend. You made a friend? How'd that happen? I can be nice if I try. Now I have two buddies. You mean me? I never said I was your buddy. And I never said you were one of the two, Talon called out over her shoulder as she sauntered from the armoury. Her shock at hearing what the stranger rescued from the mountain at Nant Garuagarth called himself had eased. She'd convinced herself her imagination had gone into overdrive about what the name meant. And yet... She couldn't rid herself of the niggling feeling that the impossible was true and she knew she would never be free of doubt until she'd seen solid proof. If this person was who she'd initially suspected he was, there was a way she could find out. The test would never stand up as a scientific experiment 
but to her it would mean a lot. She unlocked the cabin door. Major Wright had entrusted her with the security code just prior to the battle. When the door opened, she found the man sitting on his bed, petting Boots. The cat meowed, jumped down and padded over to her. As Boots rubbed against Talon's leg, the stranger pointed and said a word. Uh, she's a cat, she said. Cat, he repeated, adding something unintelligible. Boots ran off down the passageway. The man's hair was wet. He'd obviously been trying out the shower, but he didn't know it had a drying setting. Can you come with me? she asked, beckoning. He rose and padded over to her. She sent him back to put on his shoes, and then she took him to the gym. The place was empty, though Talon could hear the far-off strains of some kind of party going on. She turned on the lights and walked directly to the equipment store. The man waited patiently as she rummaged around in the back of the store. She was sure she'd seen what she was looking for somewhere in there. Then she saw them, lying under a pile of sparring helmets, grubby and lonely in the corner. A pair of staves. She reached in and slid them out from under the helmets, sending up a cloud of dust. When she'd wiped them off, the staves looked new and unused. She guessed Royal Marines were rarely required to fight with big sticks, and she didn't remember any instruction in the weapons from basic. That was a mistake, in her opinion. Staff fighting taught a lot of valuable skills different from hand-to-hand -hand or knife combat. Her father had taught her how to use them well, both defensively and offensively. She guessed the ones in the store were there in case the trainers wanted to instruct in a modern martial art. The man had moved to the shelves that held other practice equipment. He was examining the items, looking confused. But when he saw what Talon was holding, his features cleared and recognition lit his face. He nodded, seeming to want to show his understanding. Her stomach clenched. Shit. There was nothing for it except to go through with the test. She found some protective gear that fitted him and put on her own. When she walked out into the gym and stepped onto the mat, he followed her. They faced each other. He smiled and readied his weapon. Shit, shit, shit. He knew exactly what to do. She lunged, aiming at his head. Her staff cracked against his as he met it easily. Then he pushed, using his greater height and weight to force her down. She slipped out from under him, making him collapse forward, and swung the end of her staff toward his stomach. He twisted out of reach, spun right round and swiped at her. She met the blow just in time and knocked his staff hard, trying to shock it from his grip, but he was holding it too firmly. She realised her back was exposed. She dropped to the floor and his staff whistled over her head. She swept hers upward again, this time aiming for his jaw, which was hanging over her after his move. He reared back, a fraction too late. Her staff glanced his nose. They fought on, moving so fast her actions were pure training and muscle memory, with hardly any time to think. She tried some feints, but he guessed her intention every time. She tried speeding up the pace even faster, but he kept up with her. And when he went on the attack, she was barely able to counter his blows. Damn, he was good! The split second of admiration resulted in a blow to the side of her head. Her helmet saved her from any real harm, but the man certainly didn't cut her any slack. He redoubled his attack, and she was hard put to avoid being struck again and to stay on her feet. He loved that low swipe, intended to knock her legs from under her. It had been years since she'd fought with a staff, and she was feeling the lack of practice. She'd never been able to persuade a batcher to give the weapons a try. If she'd been on top form, she might have been able to beat the mystery man. At her peak performance, she'd beaten her father a few times, to his great pride and admiration. But she knew she wasn't going to see victory today. She knew what she needed to know. How to stop the fight without suffering a concussion or a cracked rib, though. The only words the man knew were her name and cat. 
Sweating and panting, she jumped backward out of his reach and dropped her staff to her side. The man understood the session was over. He gave a bow and spoke a short phrase. You fought well too, said Talon. It was good to spar with someone who matched her abilities. He'd really tested her limits. But concern of a greater nature overwhelmed her satisfaction with the match. No matter how mind-blowing and difficult it was for her to accept, no matter how much she wanted to deny the truth, she couldn't do it any longer. As well as a military veteran, her father had been a history buff specialising in ancient forms of combat. Staff fighting was a very old sport, he'd told her, something rarely practised any longer, at least not in the West. Yet this man who Wright had found entombed inside a Welsh mountain could use a staff like he'd been practising all his life. She couldn't believe it. Yet she had no choice. She felt absurd. What should she do? Drop to one knee and bow her head? Was that what people did around kings? Instead, she walked up to the man and shook his hand. Hello, Arthur. Chapter 28 Wright closed his eyes, opened them again, and then rubbed a hand over the top of his head. What? Ellis frowned at him. I know it's a lot to take in. You're telling me. She'd asked him to come to the cabin where he'd put the man he'd rescued from West B.I., after the battle with the EAC and AP, he had plenty to do, but Ellis's tone had been urgent, as if she had something extremely important to tell him, so he'd decided to spare her a few minutes. Apparently, the critical piece of information she had to convey was that the man's name was Arthur. After that, she'd spouted a load of gobbledygook about an ancient legend, fighting off invaders to the Britannic Isles, Swords, prophecies, wizards, knights and tables? Are you seriously telling me you've never heard about any of this stuff? Ellis asked tersely. I don't know, he replied, exasperated. I might have done when I was a kid. I don't remember. But what's all this got to do with him? He indicated toward Arthur with his eyebrows. The man was sitting passively on his bunk while Ellis faced him over a table. He was watching them talk, but he clearly didn't understand anything of what was passing between them. Ellis slapped her forehead. Haven't you been listening to a word I've said? Watch it, Corporal. I'm sorry, sir, but... She got up and jabbed a finger at the mystery man. It's him, King Arthur. The once and future king. In our hour of need, he will return. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Wright carefully studied her. She didn't seem to be joking. She seemed to believe it all. Perhaps she was having a psychotic break due to the stress of the battle. All the marines in her former platoon aboard the Daisy had died. She would be experiencing grief and shock. Those strong emotions, coupled with her desire to return to B.I., had probably made her confused and delusional. Rather than face her pain, she'd become fixated on the man under her responsibility. Would it be better to humour her, or should he send her to sickbay? He decided to try the former first, before resorting to more drastic action. Maybe he could still reach the rational part of her mind. All right, Ellis. Let's say what you've told me is true. I need you to explain a few things for me. She looked relieved. OK. If this man is King Arthur, returned from the dead, no, he didn't die. He was mortally wounded and carried from the field of battle. Mortally means fatally, right? Yes, it does. But he didn't die. That's the point. He should have died. But Merlin put him into a deep sleep, so he could rise again. I get it. Wright sighed. He could hardly believe he was having this conversation. So he's been in this deep sleep for, what, 
three and a half thousand years? About that, even historians who lived a few centuries after Arthur's time weren't exactly sure when he reigned. Well, he looked expectantly at the corporal. Well, what? How could he have been sleeping for millennia? It isn't possible, isn't it? Didn't you say he looked like he'd been in that cave for years? And I thought that AP had made big strides in cryonic preservation. They claim they can put people under for centuries. OK, I'll give you that. But Arthur wasn't cryonically preserved. Believe me, I'd know. He looked like he'd been dead a long time. Only he wasn't, was he? He was still alive. Who knows what Merlin did to him so he could live so long? At that time, it might have seemed like magic, but maybe it was only highly advanced medical technology, even more advanced than we have now. And how could someone living in the Dark Ages have access to highly advanced tech? Ellis huffed in frustration. Look, I don't have all the answers. I can't explain everything. I'm just as amazed as you are. Er, uh, no, I really don't think you are. Right. So you tell me who he is, how he came to be inside a sealed cave and still alive after being mummified. I can't explain it. I never said I could, but that doesn't mean I have to dream up a supernatural fairy tale as an answer. The corporal glared at him but then appeared to rein in her anger. What if... What if we forget about the impossibility of Arthur surviving so long in those conditions? Why did we go there to rescue him? We were responding to a distress call. Wright began to grow uncomfortable. Where did the signal come from? Did you ever find a transmitter? No. She had a point. The absence of a transmitter and the missing device's ability to transmit through solid rock had always bothered him, but he didn't want to encourage her in her delusion. There was no time to look for the signal origin. EAC troops were closing in. It would have been dangerous and a waste of time to hang around trying to find it. He chose not to mention that the signal had disappeared as soon as they'd broken into the cave. Who do you think sent it? Ellis asked. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Has it occurred to you that it might have been a coincidence that we happened to find him there? The signal could have been a glitch. We mounted a rescue and happened to stumble across someone in need of rescuing, but the two things might not be connected. He just happened to be there? Halfway up a mountainside in a mostly uninhabited wilderness, with EAC troops nearby? That fact had puzzled him too. Why had the EAC military been so close at hand? They'd arrived so soon after the daisy had touched down, they must have been in the vicinity. What had they been doing there? Coincidences happen, he retorted, though he knew his words had begun to sound hollow. Just because things seem to be linked doesn't mean they are. And sometimes they are connected, and people refuse to acknowledge the truth that's staring them in the face. That's enough, Corporal, he rose to his feet. Your story is ridiculous, and I have doubts about your mental stability. You're to report to Sick Bay for a psychological evaluation this afternoon. I don't need a psychological evaluation. Why can't you admit I could be right? He strode to the door. Can't you see how it makes sense? Continued Ellis, following on his heels. The EAC have taken over the Britannic Isles. We're losing our territories and we're about to lose the space war. The door opened and Wright stepped out into the passageway. The BA is going to be wiped from existence! yelled the corporal. In our hour of need, he will return. The door slid closed, cutting off the rest of her ravings. As he walked away, preparing to calm sickbay about Ellis's probable mental illness, he debated the wisdom of leaving her alone with the man Arthur. But in her fantasy, he was some kind of saviour king, so he doubted she would hurt him. 
it was time to get back to his regular duties. If Corporal Ellis had been wrong about everything else, she was right that the BA was in a bad way. If it was to survive, they would have to pull out all the stops. Chapter 29 The next step in Hans's plan had to be undertaken with utmost care. It was best if the idea didn't appear to come from him. The military leaders had to imagine they'd thought of it themselves, or they would never go through with it. Not because his plan was bad, far from it. It was the obvious solution to the BA's troubles, in the short term anyway. But the people he had to sway were a bunch of arrogant, boneheaded, stubborn vestiges of the days of empire. They would automatically reject the proposal of a foreigner, someone who didn't belong to their club, who hadn't been to the right schools and who had no friends or associates within the elite. It was a problem Hans had faced again and again as he'd risen through the ranks of CIS. If it hadn't been for the recordings he held of prominent figures committing compromising acts, he would never have been chosen to lead the organisation. His office door opened and his new personal assistant entered, bringing his coffee. Maria, good morning. How are you today? Very well, thank you, Mr Jonta. And I see you seem to be recovering well from your injuries. I am thanks to that excellent home nurse you found me. It's my pleasure, sir. I know Josie would have wanted me to do my best to help you. I'm sure she would. Maria, I was wondering, do you have a dress suitable to wear to a black tie event? She placed the cup and saucer on his desk. You mean an evening dress? Yes, something expensive and flattering. If you haven't, speak up. You can get one today. I want you to accompany me to the officer's ball. I'd be honoured, Mr Jonta. Thank you. There's no need to be grateful. You'll be working. I have a few tasks to complete tonight, and you can help me. In that case, I'll put a dress on the department's tab, and I'll need two hours this afternoon to go shopping. Ha! As you wish. He smiled wryly as she left. Maria was turning out to be quite different from her twin. She was equally resourceful, but much more up front. As the days had passed, she'd relaxed into her role and revealed more of her true personality. He liked her feistiness. But he didn't have time to waste musing about his new assistant. He had people to butter up. He opened the screen on his desk and looked up the first person on his list. The comm went through and a face appeared. Hands, long time no see. Great to hear from you. He settled into his seat and picked up his coffee. He was in his element. Today was going to be a good day. At 8.30pm that evening, when he arrived with Maria at the Caribbean ambassador's residence, the party had only just begun. He was a little early to be truly de rigueur. In fact, his timing could have been perceived as gauche, but confident that no matter what he did, he would never be accepted into society's circles, he'd long since given up trying. He could still cut a fine dash, however, and with Maria on his arm, he was certain of doing that tonight. As she'd stepped from the lobby of her apartment block to join him in the limousine, her appearance had taken his breath away. He had no interest in romantic dalliances. He'd married himself to his cause many years ago. But, for a brief moment, his resolve had been shaken. His assistant had spent her two hours of shopping and the department's budget well. Her dress was sleeveless, gossamer thin and shimmering soft gold and hung from her shoulders to her feet. She had dressed her hair as a perfect compliment, weaving gold threads through it and studding it with white jewels. And as she crossed the sidewalk to the car, she carried herself like a duchess. Who would have known plain old Josephine's identical twin could have scrubbed up so well? When she'd climbed in, most elegantly, he'd been delighted to smell a whiff of a delicious fragrance. 
Maria really was a woman after his own heart. If only his heart were not already taken. Here we are, said Hans, turning to her as the limousine pulled up outside the ambassador's palatial residence. You remember what you have to do? Of course, Mr. Jonta. Good. But enjoy yourself, too. That's what these events are about. Fun and shenanigans. He tapped his nose. Let's go. He nodded to the chauffeur who got out of the limo and opened the door on Maria's side. Hans waited for the chauffeur to open his door, then joined his assistant on the sidewalk. The night air was warm and humid and the sky was cloudless. On the fringes of the islands, the battle against their enemies continued, but for now and in this place, all was calm and safe. Together, they climbed the steps to the entrance. A small group of ushers waited just inside the open doors, clad in red and gold uniforms. The entrance hall floor of checkerboard tiles was polished to a fine sheen and marble columns rose to a ceiling exquisitely decorated in bas relief. Paintings of previous ambassadors hung on the walls, spaced at regular intervals. The oldest ones dated back hundreds of years. Hans prided himself on his appreciation of taste and he could find nothing objectionable about the scene. Everything was exactly as it should be. He breathed in deeply. Whoever was responsible for organising the occasion had even arranged for a faint sweet lemon scent to imbue the air. He could also smell wine, punch and a slight savoury odour, probably hors d'oeuvres. An usher was approaching them. Hans lifted and bent his elbow, and Maria delicately rested her hand upon it. They walked with the usher through to the central ballroom. As he'd predicted, the place was somewhat sparse in guests, due to the early hour. But both Hennessy, Chief of Defence Staff, and First Sea Lord Montague had arrived. The men were too old and well-connected to concern themselves with timing etiquette. They probably wanted to get their fill of alcohol, fine food and idle chatter before they grew too tired and needed a nap. Both men were standing near the punch bowl, looking resplendent in their dress uniforms, chatting. Hans led Maria over to them. They didn't look particularly pleased to see Hans, but the sight of his assistant awakened interest in their wrinkled faces and roomy eyes. Good evening, gentlemen, Hans said. May I introduce a vital member of my staff? Charmed, I'm sure, said Hennessy. And who might you be? After Maria gave them her name, Hans introduced Hennessy and Montague by their full titles, which apparently gratified them enormously. Any news from the fleet? Hans asked Montague. It was such a shame the attack failed. Hennessy coughed and Montague's cheeks flushed a deeper than usual pink. Damned shame, the Sea Lord muttered, but we were up against some type of new weapon. Never known anything like it. I'd appreciate your help, Jonta, with finding out what the hell it was that took the fearless. My best officers are trying to find out what they can, said Hans. As he understood it, the attack had already been going to pieces before the flagship was destroyed. Somehow the EAC and AP had gotten wind of the plan and were waiting for the BA ships, but it wasn't the right time to mention it. As soon as I hear anything, I'll pass it on immediately. You have my word. I'd be obliged, Montague replied. We have a strategy meeting in the morning. It's been a rough year but I have every hope we'll meet the new challenges that face us. So you're working for John Tyr, eh? Hennessy asked Maria. Yes, but I'm new. I've only been with Sis a short while. Ah, new and innocent, Montague exclaimed. You must tell us all his secrets. Maria replied, I'm sure I don't know anything important. You won't pull the wool over our eyes so easily, young lady, Hennessy retorted. 
Jonta's office only deals with highly sensitive intel. Even so, protested Maria. Don't worry, dear, we're only pulling your leg, said Montague. We know you won't give anything away. Jonta wouldn't have you working for him if you weren't tighter than a drum. You can leave her with us, he said to Hans. We'll look after her. But we've only just arrived, Hans protested. There are plenty more people I'd like Maria to meet. We can introduce her to everyone, replied Hennessy. Go and mingle, Jonta, mingle. We all know that's what you love doing best. Maria? I'll be fine, sir. I'm looking forward to hearing some military exploits. Ha, said Hennessy. If you love old soldiers' stories, old sailors' stories are far more interesting, interjected Montague. Hans gave Maria the barest of winks before turning to survey the room. While he'd been talking to Hennessy and Montague, more guests had arrived. He spotted the ambassador and his wife, a very influential woman, as well as the admiral recently appointed to replace the man who had been commanding the fearless. Where to go next? He made a beeline for the admiral. Maria would do her job and do it well. She already had the old goats eating out of the palm of her hand. If only they knew. Soon she would be flattering them, telling them how experienced, knowledgeable men of war like themselves should have more influence on how things were run, that everything would fall apart unless someone with some sense stepped in. It was at gatherings like these where the real wheels of power turned. Attitudes were formed, alliances were made and broken, plans were created and set in motion. He had some hard work ahead of him tonight among the glasses of fine wine and canapes, but the wounds he'd sustained in the bombing of the General Council had nearly healed and he was on top form. As Hennessy had said, it was time to mingle. Chapter 30 The kid had gone missing, but Lorcan wasn't worried. He hated the little shit and Dwyer Orr had practically twisted his arm to allow the child on the brez. If harm came to her son, she couldn't say he hadn't warned her. His guardian, an old man so senile he could barely string words into a sentence, was utterly useless at keeping the lad under control. He was always slinking around and turning up where you least expected him, and where he knew he wasn't supposed to be. If he'd gotten himself into trouble, it was his own fault. The Dweer wasn't exactly high on his list of favourite people at the moment anyway, Lorcan mused. Her abandonment of the battle at the critical moment, when everything was going their way, had been insane. Just because of some superstitious fear of whatever had taken the BA ship. He'd thought about the event for days, and his point still held. The thing had disappeared along with the ship it took. It hadn't demonstrated an intent to attack the EAC or AP fleet. They should have pressed on with their new unexpected advantage, not abandoned the fight. Hey, Sparks, he said. Play the recording from the battle. He sensed an unspoken collective groan from the staff in the control centre. It was true they must have seen the vid ten or fifteen times, but so what? There was always something new to learn. After all the years they'd worked with him, he thought they would have understood that by now. In place of the scrolling scenes from the construction of the Brez, a new vista appeared. The BA's fleet was distant points of light, little bigger than the surrounding stars. Then the screen blinked as the cameras refocused, enlarging the vessels. He frowned. What arrogant fools the Alliance's military leaders had been to think they could have destroyed one of his beautiful colony ships. How could they not know he would never have allowed that to happen, not while there was breath in his body? Nevertheless, he couldn't deny that Dwyer Orr's warning of the impending attack and support during the battle had been very useful. Until... There it was. 
The opaque cloud had puffed into space from nowhere, off in a corner of the screen. What a strange phenomenon. In his many years of studying space and in everything he'd learned from the world's top astronomers, present and past, he'd never seen or heard of anything like it. All around him, his staff continued working, ignoring the battle's replay. But Lorcan found himself drawn to the screen. He got up from his seat and walked closer. There was something hyperphysical about the cloud. He was reminded of Dwyer Orr's ramblings about quantum mechanics and the unknown aspects of universal laws. She might have called the mass dark matter or dark energy, though of course it was neither of those things. They were not dark in the literal meaning of the word for a start. The report from Deck 6 is in, said Jara. What report? asked Lorcan. About the boy, Perrin. He isn't there. They search the place top to bottom, but there's no sign of him. Yes, yes, whatever. Lorcan resented the manpower and time wasted on the search. Every member of staff and every minute spent looking for the kid put back the completion of the project. He had a good mind to send the Dweer a bill. He stared intently at the screen. The finger of cloud was reaching out. It was not hard to anthropomorphise the phenomenon. It looked like a huddled hag, swathed in rags, sending forth a bony digit, perhaps to see how fat her captive children had grown and if they were ready to eat. Only this finger didn't poke. It enveloped what it touched. It must have been terrifying, Kokoa commented. She had begun to watch the recording too. What? asked Lorcan. For the men and women on the ship. To see that thing coming for them, knowing they couldn't escape. I suppose it must have been. Was that why no one else seemed keen to watch the battle again? Not because they were bored of it, but because it made them afraid? Do you think they might still be alive? Kokoa asked. The crew of the ship? I very much doubt it. But it isn't impossible. No one has a clue what happened. I hope they are. Whether they are or not matters little, except the BA now has one less vessel with which to plague us. That was a positive outcome. The Alliance had been forced to run away with its tail between its legs. It would take time to recover from the loss of its flagship and the others destroyed in the battle. And that meant more opportunities for resource harvesting on Earth. Should we begin to search Deck 7? Jura asked. What f- Oh, that blasted kid! Lorcan returned to his seat. The battle recording now only showed the retreating ships. After a harsh, heated discussion with the Dweer, the AP and EA ships had also returned to their bases. What a wasted opportunity! If only the woman... But there was no point in going over it again. What was done was done. No, said Lorcan. Call off the search. But what about the... The kid got himself lost. He can get himself found. There are comm panels, drones and workers all over the ship. It shouldn't be too hard for a boy his age to make contact, if he really wants to. Lorcan harboured a suspicion that Dweer Orr's son wasn't lost at all, that he was hiding somewhere and very much enjoying all the attention and kerfuffle from the search. He had a feeling that little What's-His-Name would soon show his face when he realised no one was looking for him any more. Tell his guardian he's to wait in his cabin in case the boy goes there. From now on, I don't want another second spent on that child. Yes, sir. In the end, little Perrin didn't turn up for the rest of the day. But it was only when the shift was over and his department heads went to dinner, leaving him alone in the control room, that Lorcan remembered about the boy. He checked the general comms to see if he'd missed an announcement that the boy had been found, but there was nothing. He tried calming the Guardian. H hello the old man said, his face appearing on Lorcan's interface. 
I take it Dwyer Orr's son hasn't returned to your cabin. W what's that? Lorcan tutted. The kid, he said louder. Has the kid come back? No, Perrin isn't here. I was hoping he might be with you. Why the hell would the Guardian think he might be looking after the child? It beggared belief. I think I should inform the Dweer about the situation, the man said tremulously. You mean you haven't already? Lorcan had thought it strange that Carla hadn't contacted him yet. No, the Guardian paused. She will be rather angry. So that was it. He didn't want to face her, knowing she would blame him. Though actually the little shit must have slipped away deliberately, easily able to outwit the old fool. Let's leave it till morning, said Lorcan. Are you sure? Yes, he's bound to turn up by then, and the dweer will be none the wiser. If he doesn't, I'll tell her our outward comm had a fault and we weren't able to contact her. The old man looked relieved. If you're certain that's the right cause of action, sir. I am. Thank you, sir. If you haven't eaten, go to dinner and then get a good night's sleep. I will. Thank you again. Lorcan closed the comm. He couldn't help but feel sorry for the guardian. He had a raving lunatic for a mistress and a conniving snake as his ward. His life couldn't be easy. Rubbing his eyes, a sudden fatigue hit him. Lorcan decided to go straight to his suite. He was in no mood for chatter over the evening meal, though in truth he rarely was, and he had snacks he could nibble on if he grew peckish. A new consignment of genetic material had arrived a few hours ago. He was looking forward to spending the evening studying it and imagining how the species might become part of the ecosystem of a new world. He trudged the familiar passageways of the breads that took him to his rooms. When he arrived, he got the shock of his life, though later, when he looked back on it, he knew he shouldn't have been at all surprised. The kid was there. Bold as brass, he was perched on the edge of the sofa in the living room, surrounded by empty snack packets and idly browsing Lorcan's personal interface. Oh, hello, the boy said, looking up, calm as anything. For a second, Lorcan was too overcome with rage to speak, or move, or even think, until he finally spat out, You little bastard! The kid's eyebrows rose. Did I do something wrong? Lorcan uttered more foul expletives about the boy's parentage, related him to private areas of human anatomy, and suggested he perform a lewd act upon himself. You mean I wasn't supposed to come in here? Lorcan didn't bother asking him how he'd circumvented the security, or how long he'd been there, or what he'd seen in his private files. As it was, he was only just holding himself back from spacing the lad. You are going home, he said. Right now. Not taking his eyes from the Dweer's son, he calmed a shuttle pilot. The man would probably be eating, but that could wait. If the little arsehole wasn't off the brez in the next five minutes, he might do something he would later regret. But I like it here, whined the boy. Why don't you want me around? I saw a picture of a boy about my age in your files. Is he your son? Can I meet him? Or did he die like your wife? That did it. Lorcan marched over to the boy and slapped him so hard he spun around before he fell off the sofa and hit the floor. Slowly, he pulled himself into a sitting position, but he didn't cry. Instead, he sat on the rug, clutching his cheek and looking up at Lorcan with malicious eyes. I'll tell my mother you did that. Chapter 31 The writing was almost indecipherable. The lines were faint with the passage of time, and the pages of the book had been yellowed by the same process, 
so it was difficult for Carla Orr's tired eyes to separate one from the other. And, of course, the script was old, too. Very old. She'd often wondered if she was the only person in the world who knew the ancient languages in which such books were written. She'd never met or heard of anyone else who had studied them, at least not these ones, written by monks and scholars who had lived and died thousands of years ago. She sat up, stretched her aching back and rubbed her shoulders. How long had she been poring over the ancient texts? Seeing the sun's beams slanting through the leaded window of the library, she realised an entire night had passed while she'd been reading. That had to make it fifty or more hours of study since the battle. Yet she was no closer to understanding what had taken the B.A. ship. The books mentioned monsters of many kinds, mythical and spiritual, as well as actual dangerous beasts of the time. But nothing came close to what she'd seen, not even in an allegorical sense. Until she could hazard a guess as to what the thing was and its implication to the EAC, if it was dangerous or benign, and what it might portend, she didn't want to push on any further in the conflict with the BA. If the astronomical phenomenon was intelligent and could be harnessed to do others' bidding, then the EAC's struggles would be over. All she had to do was to discover how to reach its mind. Then she would simply direct it to swallow the rest of the BA fleet, shortly followed by Ua Talman's colony ships. But if it wasn't living, or if it was living but senseless, like some kind of cosmic worm, then it was as much a danger to the EAC as it was to anyone else who crossed its path and she'd been right to immediately withdraw her ships from the area. She was certain of one thing. The appearance of the entity at that place and that point in time could not be a coincidence. Before returning to her library of ancient tomes, she'd searched all the information she had on bodies in space and found nothing even resembling the cloud that had arrived from nowhere in the middle of battle. The fact that it had materialised there and then had to be significant. The same synchronicity had occurred when she'd almost retrieved the man of the myths from the cave, and at the exact same time, the B.A. had turned up. It was as if it had been predestined. What did it all mean? She reached out to the corner of the weighty volume open before her on the table, lifted it and carefully closed the book. Then she stood up and returned it to its place on the shelf, sliding it between Bede's Ecclesiastical History of England and Nennius's Historia Britonum. Carla stretched and crossed the library to the heavy oak door, darkened with age. After pulling it open, she passed through the quiet hallway. The castle was beginning to stir with movement as the other inhabitants rose for the new day. She began to climb the stairs wearily. She halted. From outside came the distant sound of an aircraft. It was not something she expected to hear in that part of the B.I. If one had been chartered for a special purpose, she would know about it. As she hesitated on the stairs, the sound grew louder. The aircraft was approaching the castle. She recognised a distinctive rumble. It wasn't an aircraft. It was a shuttle arriving from space. The speed of the craft's arrival quickly turned the rumble to a roar. She descended hastily. No shuttle was due, or at least no one had notified her of one. At the castle entrance on the opposite side of the hall, she lifted the iron bar and pushed open one of the double doors. A fresh morning sea breeze gusted in. The shuttle was already visible, a dull grey triangle swooping down from a rosy sky. One of Ua Talman's vessels. What could it mean? Had she missed a message? Superheated gas burst from the shuttle's thrusters as it came in to land, turning the air beneath it hazy. Carla wrapped her arms around herself, chilled by the wind. The landing props came down and the vessel lowered onto the pad. 
Finally, the ear-piercing noise of the engine faded. Had Lorcan come to pay her a visit? Perhaps he wanted to go over what had happened at the end of the battle again, face to face. But she'd said all she had to say on the subject. He'd had the option to press on with his own fleet and finish off the BA if he'd been so certain that was the right course of action. Only he hadn't. He hadn't wanted to take the risk without the support of the EAC. That had been his decision. Yet he continued to want to blame her. She tutted and waited impatiently, her long night catching up with her. The shuttle hatch opened and steps extended to the ground. Before the bottom step touched the flagstones, Perrin clattered down them, shouting, Mummy! and waving. He jumped the remaining gap and raced toward her. Carla's lips hardened. Why had Lorcan brought her son back so abruptly, without any notification? His short legs sped over the ground between them, his dark hair whipping around his head. When he'd covered about 75 metres, the steps hanging from the shuttle retracted inside and disappeared. The hatch closed and the engine started up. Where was Lorcan? Or Tom, her son's guardian? Had Ua Talman actually sent a young boy on the journey to Earth with only the pilot for company? Had he risked the life of her child? Perrin reached her and grabbed her around the waist, pressing his face into her. I missed you, he said, his voice muffled. Carla took his shoulders and squatted down to look him in the eyes. What happened? Why are you back so soon? A sudden thought occurred to her. Is the colony ship building site being attacked? No, Lorcan told me I had to go home right away. He was so mean. He even hit me. He hit you? Her son nodded. But I was brave. I didn't cry, Mummy. That was very brave. I can't believe he did that. Hitting a small child is a terrible thing to do. Did he hurt you badly? Perrin shook his head. I'm glad to hear it. Maybe it's for the best that he sent you home if he was going to be so bad-tempered. Why did he do it? I don't know. Hmm. Carla straightened up and softly touched her son's head. Where's Tom? He didn't come with you. He's still on the brez. I heard Lorcan tell him he can stay there as long as he likes and he can go with them to the new worlds if he wants. He did, did he? What a cheek. Come on, let's go inside. It's cold out here. When they were in the hall, she closed the door against the wind and let the bar fall into its slot. The rasping sound echoed from the stone walls. Taking her son's hand, she said, I need to go to bed now, but if you go to the kitchen, I'm sure Cook will be awake already and she'll make you some breakfast. But before you go, did you get all the information I asked for? Yes, and I memorised it all, just how you taught me. Was it hard to find? Not once I got inside Lorcan's private suite. Clever boy. Run along and have something to eat. And then I want you to put everything you learned into a file and send it to me. Can you do that? Yes, Mummy, I will. She watched him as he trotted across the hall to the doorway that led to the kitchen. Had Ua Talman suspected Perrin of snooping during his visit? Was that why he'd been so angry and sent him back without an escort? One of the reasons she'd arranged for her son to do the job was because he was young and so unlikely to be closely watched. But it was possible that Ua Talman had figured out why he was there. That would definitely put a spoke in their relationship. After their argument at the end of the battle, however, it didn't seem so important. The accord between the EAC and AP probably wouldn't last much longer anyway. Feeling more tired than ever, Carla climbed the stairs again and then went directly to her bedroom. She planned on taking a three-hour nap before tackling the puzzle of the dark space phenomenon once more. 
but when she reached her bed, her interface light was flashing. Wondering if it was Lorcan reaching out to apologise for his ill treatment of her son or accuse her of spying, she opened the screen. She'd guessed wrong. The comm was from her contact within the BA. As she read the contents, a knot of excitement formed in her stomach. The intel could be her chance to put an end to the alliance forever. But she would need the AP's help. That made the situation rather delicate. Since sending Perrin home, Lorcan would have had time to cool off, but he was the type to hold a grudge forever, and now she had two counts against her. Yet he was also pragmatic, and he wanted to stop the BA from interfering in his operations as much as she wanted their remaining lands. It wouldn't hurt to ask. If they were to take advantage of this new development, they would have to act quickly. Chapter 32 Taylan pressed the door button, wondering for the nth time if she was doing the right thing. She had debated on whether to bring Arthur along, but had decided that might work against her. Better to play on the miraculous aspects of his rescue and recovery. Who is it? said Colburn over the intercom. She sounded annoyed, but the brigadier always sounded annoyed, so her mood was no indication of the likelihood of Taylor's success in her endeavour. Corporal Ellis, ma'am, I know it's highly regular, but I'd like to speak to you in person, if I may. She cringed at the submissive tone in her voice. The old bat didn't deserve her respect, but she was going to have to fake it in order to get what she wanted. The door opened. Colburn sat behind her desk, already glowering. Talon sucked in a breath at the sight of her. She hadn't seen the woman since she'd returned from Earth. She'd heard about her injuries, but she hadn't known they were quite so bad. Make it fast, Corporal! Talon stepped into the office and waited for the door to close before saying, I don't know if Major Wright has spoken to you yet but I wondered if I could talk to you about what's going to happen to the man he rescued at West B.I. Really, Ellis, that man is the last of my concerns right now. What do you want to know? Colburn's response was about as amenable as she got. Talon decided to go for it. She doubted she would ever find the woman in a better mood. It's pretty clear he's a West B.I. native, or at least he used to be. I assume we're going to return him to his home at some point. Why would you assume that? Talon faltered. In case it isn't obvious, Corporal, we're at war. We can't go on jaunts around the solar system taking passengers home. Do you think the Valiant is a taxi service? No, but if you don't plan on taking him back to West B.I., what's going to happen to him? I imagine that if we aren't all captured, killed or annihilated by a mysterious space octopus, I'll find the time to send him in a shuttle back to Earth eventually. Probably not to West B.I., as that's now enemy territory, but to another country we still hold. That would be safest for him. When that'll be, however, I simply can't say. Now, I have work to do. You're dismissed. Talon swallowed. Here goes. When we return the man to Earth, I want to resign from the Royal Marines. I want to go with him. After Colburn had dismissed her, her head had dipped to focus her attention on her screen. Now she jerked it up, her eyes narrowed. I beg your pardon? I want to leave the Marines. I don't think the patient will survive on his own back on Earth. He needs someone to look after him. If we just set him down in the middle of nowhere with no money, not understanding the language, he'll die. It's rough down there, even in BA-held territories, unless you're rich. The brigadier swiped her screen closed, leaned back in her seat and folded her arms. Why are you so concerned about this man's welfare? I know you were part of the rescue team, but I didn't think you had much to do with the actual rescue. Is he a relation or friend of yours? Oh no, nothing like that. Then what? Colburn moved forward and rested her forearms on her desk. 
Are you feeling all right? Major Wright said he'd recommended you for a psychological evaluation. Is the reason for his recommendation something to do with this man? He didn't explain. She shook her head. That was something at least. Wright hadn't got to the brigadier first and prejudiced her against the idea of who Arthur was. Looking back, it wasn't surprising the Major had thought she was insane. The whole thing was insane. It was also true. She was convinced of it. I told Major Wright something he found hard to believe, so he thought maybe I was a little crazy. What did you tell him? That... Tail and sighed. OK, I'll explain it to you, but, Mum, I need you to hear me out before you pass judgement. Go ahead. So she tried again. This time she went more slowly, telling the brigadier about the legends surrounding Arthur, but not connecting him with them at first, only emphasising the facts that coincided with the manner and timing of his discovery. To her credit... Colburn didn't interrupt her once or roll her eyes, as Wright had done. Next, Taylor went on to the rescue and the state of Arthur when he was found. She described the talks and his tattoos, particularly the dragon, because it was significant to the story. His father had been Uther Pendragon, and the mythical beast had also appeared on his battle standard. She also related how the translation software hadn't been able to identify the language Arthur spoke. Before she could get to the crucial part, however, when she could tell Colburn she thought the ancient monarch had miraculously returned, the brigadier interrupted her. You think our mystery man is the same legendary King Arthur? Taylor let out her relief in a heavy exhalation. I do. It sounded less impossible when someone else said it. Colburn was silent. Taylor waited a while and then said, Are you from B.I.? Have you heard the stories? I am, and I have, a long time ago. All that you've told me is correct as I understand it. So you think he's the same Arthur? No, of course not. I understand now why Major Wright thought you were mentally ill. She continued to frown, her lips pursed, not speaking. Taylor didn't know what to make of the brigadier's reaction. It was disappointing that no one agreed with her. She'd also told a bachelor about her idea, but he'd only laughed and patted her condescendingly on the shoulder. Leave it with me, said Colburn suddenly. So you're dismissed. She wasn't going to tell her anything? Taylor didn't leave immediately, hoping if she hung around the brigadier might relent, but the woman ignored her, reopening her interface. Angry and frustrated, she marched to the door, but then Colburn ordered her to wait. So she was going to tell her something. The brigadier was rummaging in a drawer. I thought, she murmured. Then she looked up and squinted as she focused on Taylor's neck. She was wearing Kayla's necklace again. Major Wright had given it back to her, probably without Colburn's say-so. I see, said the brigadier quietly, apparently understanding the jewellery had transported back to Taylor without her permission. She snapped. You can go. Stepping quickly through the door before the woman changed her mind, Taylor almost walked directly into Wright. What were you doing in there? he asked accusingly as the door slid closed. I went to see Colburn. I can see that. What about? Arthur, you aren't going to let this go, are you? No. Did you tell her you gave me back my necklace? No, I didn't. Well, she knows I have it. Right, grimaced. I thought she'd forget about it. Looks like you were wrong. He took her arm and pulled her away from the door, muttering, That's me up shit creek. I'm not so sure, said Taylor. I think she was going to give it back to me. You only beat her to it. I don't think she'll make a big deal of it. She's changed. You think? Wright asked. They had begun to walk along the passageway. 
Taylor didn't know where he was taking her. I don't mean her injuries. She isn't as scary as she was. Hmm, maybe. Something seemed to be bothering him. Taylor realised she thought the same about him, that he was different now. Did they know something she didn't? What could be so bad they were keeping it to themselves? I thought you were on your way to see Colburn, Taylor said. No, I was on my way to find you. A batcher told me where you'd gone. I was hoping to catch you before you spoke to her and save you from embarrassing yourself. But it's clear I was too late. What did she make of your fantasy? It's not a... she protested angrily. But then she gave a frustrated groan. I know it sounds loopy, but there's no need to make fun of me. You're getting way too familiar, Corporal. Watch yourself. Taylor rolled her eyes, but she didn't say anything. Another reason I wanted to find you was I have an idea for something that'll convince you you're suffering from a delusion. Oh, right. What's that, then? A language acquisition program. Huh? Learning software. It's only recently been developed. Direct computer brain interface that fast wires the mind into acquiring new knowledge and skills without the need for all that boring teaching and rehearsing. We plug your Arthur into it, he speed learns English, and then, after three or four days, he'll be able to tell you himself who he really is. Chapter 33 Uh-huh. Hmm. Uh-huh. Lorcan drummed his fingertips on the arm of the park bench. Sometimes it made a nice change to get away from the Brez's control room and his suite and to visit in person some of the sections of the ship that were already built and finished. Here, at West Lake, he could imagine what his life might be like when the ship was finally complete and, with her sisters, she would sail into galactic space on her long journey. He could imagine waking from cryo for a few months of physical recuperation and wandering down to the lake or another of the Brez's many natural habitats where he could sit or walk or even swim in the water, enjoying the pleasant warmth of the pseudo-sunlight. Then all the strife and worry of the construction phase of the colony fleet would be far behind him. Earth itself would be light years distant along with the ridiculously conservative BA and the insanely cultish EAC. Once he was gone they could continue slugging it out till kingdom come for all he cared. He squinted up through the tree canopy appreciating the quality of the dappled light. He hated to admit it, even to himself, but Kakoa had done a good job in creating the forest. The trees were growing healthily, plunging their roots into the rich loam, reaching up their leafy branches to the intense lighting of the overhead lamps. They might have been growing in a forest in New England for all their plant minds knew. A breeze started up and set the foliage rustling and swaying. Through a gap in the vegetation, the surface of the lake became busy with waves. Lorcan smiled. Are you still there? we're all asked. Yes, yes, he replied. Go on. I asked you a question. The Dweer sounded peeved, which was unsurprising, as Lorcan had in fact tuned out of their conversation minutes ago. He'd understood the reason for her calm after the first few sentences she uttered, carefully avoiding the topic of her loathsome son. The rest was all nonsense and flattery, she clearly wanted his help and was desperately backtracking after their earlier schism. He didn't need to hear anything else she said. He only had to decide whether he was going to agree to reform their alliance. I apologise. I must have been distracted. Could you say that again? I asked you if you believe my interpretation is correct. Of what this faction within the BA has planned? Yes. Exasperation leaked into her tone. I think it's reasonable. Reasonable enough to act upon? This could be our best and only chance for crushing the BA so hard it never recovers. 
and for eliminating this threat that concerns you. Lorcan guessed that was her real focus. Was she regretting withdrawing from the battle and losing the opportunity to destroy the BA ships and all they contained? It would be typical of the way her mind worked. She seemed to have a weird superstition about this threat, as if it was more dangerous to her and the EAC than the entire BA. That might be a welcome side benefit. Of course it would, my dear. My problem is, he said, then hesitated as he considered how to frame his objection. My problem is we had that opportunity not so long ago. Mustering the ships and crew for the battle was not easy or cheap, and things were heavily in our favour. We've been over this. And yet I feel it's worth going over again, particularly when you're asking me to commit to a similar undertaking. I explained my reasoning, said the Dweer irritably. And may I remind you, if it weren't for my intel and the support of my ships and my crews, your precious colony vessel would be nothing but space flotsam by now. Lorcan paused as a way of avoiding conceding the point. He hadn't decided what to do about her proposal and needed time to consider. Stalling, he asked, did your research turn up anything about the phenomenon? No, she sighed, but I haven't given up. I know it must mean something. I just don't know what. He wasn't surprised. To someone like her, everything meant something. Has it occurred to you that this thing, whatever it was, might return? And this time it might take one of our ships. It's a possibility, but this time the assault will be on the surface, not out in space. Has it occurred to you that it might materialise out there and swallow the brez? Frowning, he stood up and began to walk down the path to the lake. There was something about the dweer. He couldn't put it into words, but there was something about her that got under his skin. He had a temper and suffered no fools, but beneath it all he was generally calm and collected, except when it came to dweer or... She seemed to instinctively know which of his buttons to press, needling away at him and unsettling him, forcing him to take her seriously and bending him to her schemes. It's important that we understand what happened, she continued, but we shouldn't let it influence our decision on what to do here on earth. I'll be frank, he said. How am I to know that if we go ahead with your plan, you won't back out at the last minute as you did before. Those were unusual circumstances. This will be different. The BA will be at its weakest. I have no intention of backing out. This chance will never come again. He had reached the lake, where fresh clear water lapped against a pebble shore. The pebbles had come from a beach on the coast of Baja, California and it had taken considerable effort to clean them of the sea salt and macro and micro organisms before placing them around the edge of the lake. Then Kakoa had seeded them with flora and fauna appropriate to the new conditions. So much time and so much work, and the same was true of everything that made up the Brez, the Balor and the Banba. Uatalman, snapped Dwir Orr. I need a decision from you, quickly. If we're going to do this, we're going to need all the time we have available to prepare. The truth was, what she was proposing made sense. In her shoes, he would do exactly the same thing. But there was the history of his last experience of working with her and the woman herself. His gut reaction was to say no, simply because there was something about her that set him on edge. I'll think about it he said. But I said I would think about it. He closed the com. Make her wait. Let her be the one to squirm in discomfort for once. Chapter 34 The waiting was unbearable. It had been four days since Talon had seen Arthur four days while Wright put him through the learning programme that would allow him to understand and communicate in English. 
She had insisted on their separation herself. If she hadn't spent the entire time away from the ancient man, not even setting eyes on him, when he would finally tell his tale, Wright might accuse her of coaching him. Supporting training sessions had helped to pass the time. The sergeant leading them was different from the one she'd crossed swords with previously, and she'd done her best not to go up against him, not even when she felt he was teaching something incorrectly. It was hard, but she couldn't deny that she'd stepped out of line before, when she'd been heartsick for her kids and feeling useless. Her dissatisfaction must have shown, however, because at one time the training officer had said sarcastically, If you think you can do it better, be my guest, Corporal. So she had done it better. To give the man his due, he'd only blinked and said, Deadpan, Good job spotting my deliberate mistake. Everyone, copy what Ellis did. Playing Shang-Chi with a batcher had also helped to keep her occupied as the days dragged by. He continued to beat her consistently. She didn't think she would ever grasp the intricacies of strategy her friend demonstrated. Every game she would find her general blocked and defenceless and she would lose. It was as much of a foregone conclusion as the outcome of their sparring sessions. You know, he said, when they were in an empty cabin one day, toward the end of a particularly hard-fought game, which at one point she'd actually thought she had a chance of winning. I almost feel bad when you realise you've lost again, little chick, and your face falls. Almost feel bad? Almost. Is that feeling strong enough to ever let me win? Would you ever let me win when we spar? Absolutely not. I didn't think so. But that's a life and death thing. What if I threw a fight one day out of pity and you used the same moves in a battle and died? Exactly. But it's not the same as playing Shang-Chi. This is a game. Talon wasn't seriously asking him to play badly so she could win for once. She was only kidding. Beating a batcher at Xiangqi wouldn't mean squat if it wasn't a genuine victory. Isn't that what battles and wars are? he asked. Games? No, people die. That's no game. Not to the people who die, but perhaps to those who move them around. He lifted a chariot and moved it two squares, cutting off one of her general's avenues of escape. Perhaps to them it's a game. Maybe one day you'll be the person moving others around. You'll need to understand strategy then. Huh, I don't think so. Talon shivered. A batcher's analogy was right on point. To the admirals, generals and commanders, he and she were Shang-Chi pieces to be deployed with a single end in mind, sacrificed as needed, important only while they remained useful. She'd been naive. When she'd enlisted, it had been with the idea she would be able to do something about the things that mattered to her, free West B.I. from the EAC, allow the refugees to return home, punish the soldiers who had killed civilians in cold blood, find her children. But to the Royal Marines, she was only a unit, part of a fighting force for others to command. What she thought, felt or wanted didn't matter. She'd signed up to try to do some good in the world and right wrongs. But in fact, all she'd done was hand over the decision about how to do good and exactly what good meant to someone else. Don't let it get you down, said Abacha, studying her expression. At least we know we're on the right side. Do we? I'm not so sure. If our last attack had succeeded, we would have murdered thousands of civilians on one of Ua Talman's colony ships. Have they done any evil? If they have, I'm not aware of it. They're innocent people doing their jobs. They've just signed up to an enterprise that'll take them away from Earth one day. Are they to blame for the way the project ravages the world's remaining resources? Are they wrong for wanting a better life? No, they aren't wrong, he replied softly. I guess that's what we all want, a better life, a safe life. 
Talon was about to make her next futile move when she suddenly lost the little enthusiasm she'd had for the game. She let her hand fall to her side and said, I concede. Why? There are many more moves available to you before I win. He smiled at her wickedly. What's the point? I know when I'm beat. Sometimes it makes sense to give up. No, seriously. Even now you can get out of the trap. Can't you see it? If I could see it, don't you think I would have done it? Shang-Chi just isn't for me. If you say so. A batter shrugged and began sweeping the pieces off the board into their box. Talon leaned an elbow on the table and rested her chin on the heel of her upturned palm. This whole situation's a trap. She paused and then blurted, I told Wright I wanted to resign. You did? Her friend replied, surprised. What did he say? He told me it was impossible, said I had to serve out my term. I suppose even if I could resign, there's nowhere for me to go. I'd still be stuck on the Valiant. There are worse places to be. I wouldn't like to be Earthside right now. Between the EAC-controlled countries, where technology is being phased out, and the polluted, ecologically ruined areas that AP is exploiting, and the BA territories, mostly under attack, where would you go? Home she replied simply. I'd go home. But what about your friend, the one who came back from the dead? I'd take him with me. No one believes who he is anyway. Maybe that's what I'm meant to do, she added, musing. Her eyes widened. Maybe I'm supposed to take him back so he can save the B.I. from invasion like he did before. She sucked in a breath. I've been wrong all this time. I've been trying to make Wright and Colburn believe me, but why? What would they do if they did believe he is who I say he is? It isn't like they could promote him or take orders from him. He's an Iron Age chieftain, for God's sake. He's from a time when men fought with swords in muddy fields. If he's going to save us, it isn't going to be through commanding the BA military. That look in your eye is worrying me, little chick. Don't tell me you're planning on doing something stupid. She stared at him. I have to get Arthur. No. Off the ship. No. Come on, I need your help. No, Talon. Shaving off the cook's eyebrows, hiding a warrant officer's helmet and sneaking a cat aboard are completely different from stealing a shuttle. We're at war. We could be executed but it could be the only chance we have to save the BA. That's not our job. Even if this guy is the one from the legend, he's here now, right? It's up to him to do whatever he's supposed to do. Helping him isn't our responsibility. He can't be expected to do it all single-handed. He's illiterate in our language, for one thing, and he doesn't even know what a gun is, let alone how to fire one. There are plenty of people who can teach him that. But not you, huh? Talon frowned at him. No, not me. And there's no need to look at me like that. I'm only pointing out, where are you going? She had stood up. I'm going to find out how Arthur's doing with the learning programme. In fact, she mostly wanted to leave a bachelor's company. He'd shown her he wasn't the person she thought he was. She was disappointed and angry with herself for not seeing it before. Let me know when you find out, he called as she left. She didn't reply. As she approached Arthur's cabin, the door opened and Boots walked out. The door closed and he turned around, sat down and meowed, asking to be let in again. The cat's ridiculous antics made her smile and lightened her mood somewhat. She pressed the button, and when Wright let her in, Boots trotted in alongside her. Arthur was sitting on his bed, his hair about a centimetre longer than it had been when she'd last seen him. It was now down to his shoulders, thick and shining healthily, but his eyes were bloodshot with dark circles underscoring them. The learning programme had certainly taken its toll. 
Wires ran from the interface in the table to a net shaped to fit a human skull that lay on the bed. How is he? she asked Wright, who was doing something with the interface. I'm fine, Talon, Arthur replied. She gave a gasp of joy. You can understand me now? I can. It's still hard for me, but I can understand and speak your language at a simple level. You should improve quickly, said Wright. Now you know the basics. Talon realised that from the moment she'd entered the cabin, the Major hadn't looked at her. Her heart sank a little. Did it mean that he'd already asked Arthur about his history and discovered she was wrong about him? Was Wright feeling embarrassed for her? The thought that it wasn't King Arthur they'd rescued from a mountain in West B.I. made her sad, but she wasn't devastated. If it had all been a crazy dream, it didn't matter so much, knowing the man was better now, safe and able to communicate with the people around him. You look tired, said Talon. Are you sure you're OK? A medic's been in attendance throughout, Ellis, said Wright crisply. Arthur's completed the programme. There won't be any need for further treatments, so there's no need to worry. He rested his back against the bulkhead and folded his arms, finally looking her in the eyes. Don't you want to ask him who he is and where he's from? Was that triumph or bitterness in his tone? She couldn't tell. I'll save you the trouble, said Arthur. Please, sit down, Talon. When she joined him on the bunk, he took one of her hands in his. I have much to thank you for. You have been my champion. Ah, uh, no, not me. It's Major Wright you should thank. He's the one who rescued you from the mountain. Is that so? I didn't know that. He turned to look at the Major, but Wright only waved a hand as if his act was of no consequence. Arthur turned his attention to her. But since I entered this new dream, you are the one who has cared for me. You brought me the cat to be my companion. You have taught me how to use all the wondrous machinery of this world. We even practised with staves. If it were not for you, I would have been lost and alone. You're welcome, but what was that you said about entering a new dream? He thinks he's dreaming, explained Wright. I've tried telling him he isn't several times. He gave a heavy sigh. No, this is reality, Talon said. She couldn't wait any longer. Could you tell me who you are? Your title, I mean. She held her breath. I have many. Some call me Arthur the Usurper, Arthur the Interloper, or Arthur the Bastard. Others call me King of Britain. Her hand flew to cover her mouth. You... you really are? Yes, said Wright quietly. That's who he says he is anyway. Suddenly the Major's gaze became distant and his mouth fell open. He was listening to a comm. Whatever the message was, it was serious. Chapter 35 Hans wasn't there to witness most of it. As soon as it all began to kick off, he'd removed himself from the situation, lest suspicion for engineering the coup fell on him, or worse, he became a target. That was the problem with leading from the shadows. Anonymity made you vulnerable. He lived alone in his rented villa. The maid and cook went home at 8pm, and they'd already left by the time he arrived. The only other visitor he saw regularly was the private nurse who stopped by once a day in the early morning to administer the treatment for his injured lungs and to change his remaining wound dressing. He'd entered the dark, quiet house on the hillside in a secluded, rural part of the country and after turning on the lights he'd gone straight to the kitchen to make himself a pitcher of gin and tonic with ice and lemon. It was going to be a long night. 
Settling himself in a comfortable padded rattan chair on the veranda, he opened an interface and went directly to his usual vidnews channel. The reports were already coming in. He grinned to himself, gleeful. It had all worked out so well, better than he could have hoped. Breaking news, the headline shouted. Army storms temporary parliament building in Kingston. Behind the words was a frozen still of the plain blocky edifice at night with soldiers mounting an assault on the entrance and rappelling down the walls to swing in at the windows. Pulse fire flashed in the darkness from inside the building and outside as government guards put up a defence. Suddenly, the words disappeared and the picture became live. The scene had changed. The guards were gone from the entrance, except for one, who lay face down and not moving. Black scorch marks from pulse bolts covered the wall and shattered glass shards littered the sidewalk. Bursts of laser fire shone through the empty windows. Unseen ambulances were racing closer, the screams of their sirens echoing in the night. Then the scene changed again. A news anchor was sitting behind a desk in a TV studio, talking to someone off screen. She realised she was live and turned to the camera. Unbelievable news tonight, ladies and gentlemen. As I speak, the Britannic government is under attack. MPs were holding a late debate in the new Parliament chambers when, approximately 20 minutes ago, soldiers stormed the building. According to witnesses, the fight on the steps was over quickly. At the moment, we have reports of three dead, but these have yet to be confirmed. The fighting inside is still going on, and we're trying to get in contact with someone in the building who can give us an update on the situation. Most worryingly, it seems that, though the police were called, no officers were sent to the scene. That's right. The police service has provided no response and appears unwilling to protect the members of parliament or government workers inside the building. This may be because the troops mounting the attack appear to be our own Britannic Alliance Army. It's hard to believe, but we are assured the soldiers are wearing BA uniforms. However, it's possible they may be fake and a foreign force, such as the Antarctic Project or the Earth Awareness Crusade, could be masquerading as our own troops in order to sow confusion. And it certainly is a confusing situation, ladies and gentlemen. Confusing and chaotic. We will bring you updates and clarification as soon as we have them. So please, the anchor became distracted for a beat, then said... I'm happy to say we have a reporter on the scene. Ben Mathers is outside the Parliament building. Can you hear me, Ben? The screen split, and in one half the street view appeared, but this time the camera was focused on a nervous reporter. Behind him, onlookers huddled, gawking at something unseen. The reporter walked a few paces, and the camera followed him. Now the compromised Parliament building could be seen in the background. Yes, I can hear you, Sandra. I can tell our viewers that the fighting isn't over yet and it's probably wise to stay away from the downtown Kingston area tonight. As you can see, he cringed and ducked as an explosion rang out. The camera operator must also have bobbed down because the view abruptly shifted to the onlooker's legs and the crouching reporter. Looking embarrassed and frightened, he straightened up and said, As you can hear... It's a determined, aggressive attack on our government and... Ben, said the anchor, we've heard the soldiers are wearing BA uniforms. Can you deny or confirm that? I'm sorry, could you say that again, Sandra? As she'd spoken, the glass frontage of the Parliament building had collapsed and spilled out onto the street. I said, is it our own troops who are mounting this attack? I'm no expert on uniforms, the reporter replied but the couple that I've seen did appear to be dressed as BA military. That's deeply concerning. Would you say this looks like a military coup? It's too early to be sure, but... Hans looked up, distracted by headlights approaching along the road. Only a few people lived on the hillside, and his villa occupied the highest spot. 
There was no reason for anyone to drive over the hill when the faster freeway went around it, especially at night when there was no view. He put down his drink and peered into the darkness, watching the car. The twin headlights drew closer, meandering around the bends and curves of the road, until finally they reached the bottom of his drive, where they stopped. They winked out. A car door opened and was slammed shut. Hans closed the interface and placed it screen downward on the table before standing up. No street lights illuminated the road in that part of the island, so he couldn't see the car or who had been in it and was presumably now walking toward his house. He had a sudden urge to turn off the house lights, but it was too late. Whoever was coming already knew someone was home. Should he go inside? Barricade the door? He had no guns in the house or anything else with which to defend himself. He wasn't that kind of person. His conflicts and disputes were of the mind or personality. If the BA military had thought to include him in there, he nearly collapsed with relief. A woman had walked into the pools of light that spilled from the lamps on his veranda. A woman in the bright clothes of the islands, her hair wrapped in a vivid pink cloth. Maria. What brings you out here at this time of night, Maria? If I'd known you wanted to visit, I would have sent my... Mr. Jonta, I'm glad to see you're safe and sound. May I come in? But of course. He opened the screen door and she climbed the few wooden steps. Would you share a gin and tonic with me? or I could make you something else. A gin and tonic would be very welcome, thanks. Hans went to get another glass, and by the time he returned, Maria was sitting in the second armchair on the veranda. He poured her a drink from the pitcher and handed it to her before also sitting down. Maria took a sip and remained silent. A sense of calm pleasantness hit him. How nice it was to be here with an intelligent, perceptive, affable woman sharing a cocktail on a star-filled warm evening surrounded by the songs of cicadas and croaking frogs. He was tempted to forget all about the scene playing out in Kingston, despite the years of work it had taken to bring about. He had enough money to retire. If she were willing, they could live together somewhere off the beaten track and away from worldly troubles, in as much luxury as the place afforded, spending their days having interesting conversations and enjoying simple hobbies. Then he blinked and returned to the present. He'd worked too hard and sacrificed too much to give it up now. He also knew himself too well. He was not that old man who could content himself in mundane things. He needed intrigue and artifice, or life would not be worth living. Have you heard what's happening in town? asked Maria eventually. No? What? She shot him a knowing glance. I dare you to lie to me about this. He laughed sheepishly. You mean the disturbance at Parliament? I did pick up something on the vid news in the car as I was coming home. Has the situation developed? You could say that, she replied, her gaze on her drink where a slice of lemon floated. The building's been taken over and the Prime Minister has been thrown in jail. He has? By whom? Maria's dark brown eyes focused on him again, half-lidded. Her lips curved into a lazy smile. Mr. Jonta, I've been a good employee, haven't I? You've been pleased with my work? You've been exemplary. I have no complaints whatsoever. Would you say I've earned your trust? I would. Absolutely. Then I'd like to suggest we move our relationship to another level. A level where we can speak frankly and without fear of reprisal. A level of mutual respect. I have a lot of respect for you, Maria. I'm not sure what you mean. That evening at the ambassador's residence, when you asked me to pump up the military men's sense of self-importance and encourage their dissatisfaction with the government, that was part of a larger plan you had, wasn't it? Hans was silent. 
Sir, you wouldn't have asked me to do that for no reason. Please don't insult my intelligence. He put his hands behind his neck and laced his fingers, looking out into the darkness. As I said, I have a lot of respect for you. That doesn't mean you should be privy to everything that goes on at Sis. But this isn't Sis. This is you, isn't it? Mr. Jonter, Josie always used to tell me how much she admired you. She was in awe of you. And now that I know you well, I feel the same. So understand that I'm coming from the position of someone who supports you when I say I think tonight's military coup is your doing. Hennessy and Montague might believe they dreamed up the idea themselves, but it was really you, wasn't it? Hans took a drink, swished the bitter liquid around his mouth and swallowed before answering, I don't blame you for your curiosity, but do you really think someone worthy of your admiration would ever admit to such a thing? She'd been leaning over her chair's arm, her body turned toward him. When she heard his reply, she slumped against her seat back. You and your clever answers. You're too smart for me. But let's speak hypothetically. If the head of Sis did incite a military coup, what might be his reason? If the government is no longer in control of the alliance, he would lose power and influence too. What could his end goal possibly be? Hans smiled and stood up. All the ice in the pitcher has melted. I'll make us another batch of G&T. Then, shall we watch the vid news and see how the night unfolds? Chapter 36 They had killed the Queen, but the bees lived on, buzzing noisily and irritatingly. Now it was time to set the hive on fire. Carla arrived in Jamaica aboard one of the hindmost amphibious craft, a large vessel carrying military vehicles to expedite the invasion of the BA stronghold and temporary seat of its parliament. AP ships at sea beyond the immediate conflict zone in the outer Caribbean islands had begun the attack. Missiles erupted from launchers, first targeting BA military bases and airports across the islands, and then Kingston, Fort de France, Bridgetown and St George's, devastating the capitals and sending the local populations into terror-stricken stampedes as they fought to escape to the countryside. Then the EAC aircraft took the baton and mounted an air assault. The Royal Air Force was already in the air, but its defence was weak and poorly coordinated. The EAC planes avoided or shot down the defenders and commenced bombing the areas the AP ships had missed. The Royal Navy also responded, racing out to strike at the AP ships, but they were too few and too late. Their resources had been stretched beyond their limit for years as they'd fought to defend numerous BA territories and protectorates. Finally, when the combined forces had pulled the sting from the BA's tail, amphibious assault vessels smashed onto the beaches, enemy soldiers poured from them like ants from a drowning nest. They ran up the dunes and rocky headlands, mowing down the thin opposing forces and taking no prisoners. Could you please stay below, ma'am, said the commander of Carla's amphibious craft, a woman named Novak. Just till I give the all clear, for your own safety. Carla nodded her agreement, though reluctantly. She knew she could get out and walk across the sand without being harmed, but she didn't want to distract or disturb her officer. Distant sounds of fighting were penetrating the solid steel hull as she waited at the bottom of the companionway, and a hot, acrid smell began to permeate the air. The vessel's force shield was heating up as it absorbed defensive pulse fire, but again she harboured no worries. The armaments along the shore were inadequately manned. As she had predicted, the main force of the BA had been occupied in Kingston and elsewhere in the Caribbean islands, 
taking over banks and government offices and suppressing civilian protests when the initial air assault had begun. Taking advantage of the military coup and launching the offensive from neutral Cuba had been a piece of cake. Uatalman had guaranteed 1,000 places aboard the Banba for the country's elite in exchange for its government's cooperation. When it came to deciding who would take the places, there would be vicious fighting and probably bloodshed, but that was none of her concern. From the bow of her craft came the sound of vehicle engines revving and the vibration of their motion as they drove away, heading inland. Carla grew impatient. The moment of victory, of utter domination over the arrogant, anachronistic, misguided Britannic alliance was so close she could almost feel it. Only one, perhaps two, deeds were needed for her triumph to be complete. Boom! Even within the vessel the sound was loud, and Carla thought she'd felt the deck shift slightly under her feet. What was that? she yelled. A moment, please, replied Novak from up ahead. I don't think... no. The wait for an answer dragged out. Meanwhile, footsteps rang from overhead as the last of the EAC troops left the vessel. Eventually, the commander said, It was a wind power site going up. Carla hadn't given orders to target the island's energy generation plant. She wasn't sure how she felt about it. In the early days of invasion, until the place had converted to the EAC way of doing things, the free energy could have been useful. Perhaps the assault had been one of Lorcan's ideas, or maybe it was collateral damage. Either way, she concluded phlegmatically, the plant was no great loss, and depriving the island of electricity would be an advantage when it came to suppressing any resistance from the surviving citizens. Cutting off resources from the remaining Britannic Isles natives had helped to crush them after that invasion. She heard nothing for a couple of minutes, no shouts, no vehicle engines, no booted feet running. The area must be secure now, Commander, she called to Novak. The officer came out to join her. It should be fairly safe, Mum, though I'd feel better if you would suit up. We have plenty of... Reacting to Carla's stare, she swallowed the rest of her sentence. I'll accompany you. She climbed the ladder to the hatch and opened it. Carla followed. The sun was coming up as they emerged into fresh air. Novak stepped out onto the deck and Carla quickly did the same, eager to move on to her next tasks. In the distance beyond the dunes, the sky remained dark, but it was an artificial darkness created by billowing clouds of dark grey smoke. Closer to hand were the destroyed armaments of the BA land force, twisted and wrecked. Among grassy tussocks and salt scrub lay bodies deformed into ugly angles, their blood soaking into the sand. EAC advance amphibious assault craft ranged down the beach at the shoreline. The tide was coming in and waves were splashing up and over their hulls. All was surprisingly quiet. Aside from the noises of the sea, little could be heard. Novak really had waited until the fighting was completely over before allowing her dwear out into the area. Carla was mildly annoyed, knowing the commander had delayed her gratification, but she grudgingly allowed the officer's caution had come from a good place. Is my vehicle ready? Yes, ma'am, it's over there. I have a company awaiting us at the road. She led Carla to a ramp that ran down to the beach. At its head sat an all-terrain vehicle with two soldiers in the back seats. Novak opened a door for Carla, then climbed in the other side. Reaching out to the dashboard, Carla set the map coordinates she'd memorised. The island's net was out, but EAC vehicles could link to the AP satellites. They drove over the dunes, swaying and bumping, as the car took them by the shortest route to the nearest road. 
The tough seaside plants grew thicker and taller the further inland they drove, and the ground flattened out. The way before them had already been broken through by the advancing EAC troops. It looked like they hadn't met much resistance once they'd left the shoreline. It had all gone to plan. The military coup on top of the fighting at the outer islands had drained the already thinly spread BA defences in the Caribbean to a shadow. Their military leaders had been astoundingly foolish. Carla didn't think of herself as a particularly clever strategist. She had always relied on the fervent religious zeal of her followers to win many of her battles. But she would never have been so dumb as the Britannic Alliance. It really didn't deserve to survive. They drove out onto the road and the waiting convoy of armoured vehicles fell into line behind them. May I ask where we're going? said Novak. We are on our way to the last known location of King Frederick. No kidding. I didn't know he was hiding out here in Jamaica. I guess it makes sense. There were several possibilities. I suspected he might have been moved to Oceania, probably Australia. It's easy to hide someone in the wilderness there. But my sources couldn't turn up anything. Next I looked in India, where the BA has historical ties. I thought he might be in a mountain refuge, but that was a blank too. The Caribbean was the last place I looked. I couldn't believe the BA government would be stupid enough to keep their monarch in the same location as their new parliament. But I overestimated them, in this and many other things. Looking somewhat embarrassed, Novak half-turned in her seat toward Carla and quietly asked, When it's all over, will we be holding a victory celebration? If you mean will we be blessing the Caribbean islands and returning them to Earth's embrace, naturally we will, in a month or so, when we've cleansed them of their former inhabitants. Hmm, was all the commander responded, but she seemed satisfied. Carla could appreciate why. She also enjoyed the celebrations. The car crested a rise and the road wound out through the hilly ground in front of them. The light was growing stronger and now it was easy to see to the horizon. She thought she could see King Frederick's hiding place. To the right a grey slate roof was visible among the trees, an unusual construction for a tropical island. Sure enough, after another minute's travel, the car turned into a driveway and came to a halt. Heavy gates barred the way. On the other side of them, an avenue of trees ran into the distance. Ah, said Novak, don't worry, dear. we'll make quick work of that. She wasn't lying. Ten minutes later, after she'd given the order, the gates lay in a hot, twisted mess. Carla waited as soldiers dragged them off the road, hooking them with their rifle butts, the metal scraping channels in the gravel. Then her journey to find King Freddy recommenced. They encountered some armed resistance farther down the long driveway that led to the stately home, but it was quickly dispersed. The fight had clearly gone out of the BA forces. She didn't send soldiers after the departing BA guards. They would meet their end in the mop-up operation. Inside the mansion, all was silent. Whatever servants had worked there had apparently fled hours ago. Had they taken the young king with them? That would be inconvenient. Carla ordered a thorough search of the place, from the basement to the attic. In these old houses, hiding places and nooks and crannies abounded. She waited while the search went on, sitting on one of the antique chairs in the hall. The invasion had gone smoothly so far. She hoped there wouldn't be too much of a delay in finding the brat. From all around came the sound of her troops opening doors and running up and down stairs and along passageways. She tapped the floor with the toe of her shoe. Finally, the shout went up. The king had been found. Novak's head appeared over the banister railing. He's on the second floor, ma'am. Good. Bring him down. Er... Uh, 
a woman's with him. She's putting up quite a fight. What would you like us to do? Is it his mother? I don't think so. She's too old. Probably a servant. Maybe his former nurse. It doesn't matter. Kill her. Yes, dear. Novak's head disappeared. A few beats later, a long, agonised child scream echoed out from somewhere in the building. Carla stood up, preparing to leave. She had another stop to make that day before her work was over. Young King Freddy was about Perrin's age. She estimated, he was squeezed in between two soldiers on the back seat of the car. As they left the house that had been his home since the Britannic Isles had fallen, the kid was blubbing like a boy half his age. His eyes and face red and wet, strings of snot hanging from his nose as he huffed and sobbed. Carla curled her upper lip and turned to face forward. How undignified! Perrin would never have behaved so pathetically. Not even if she herself had had her throat cut in front of him, for all his expensive tutoring, apparently no one had taught the boy to have a fucking backbone. Where are we going now? asked Novak. Our next port of call is Kingston Prison. When the commander cocked her eyebrow at her questioningly, Carlo explained, "The B A Prime Minister is there, Beaumont Smith. They put their leader in jail." I don't know why you're so surprised, Commander. I would have thought you'd seen enough of how the B A work by now. There's very little intelligence to their actions. I knew about the coup, but I imagine their military invented some crimes he supposedly committed, in order to justify taking over the government and locking him up. That's often how these things work. Yeah, that makes sense. Carla frowned. The noises from the back seat were getting annoying. Could you put a gag on him or something? She asked one of the soldiers. After a brief scuffle and some shouting, the kids crying quietened down, though it was still loud enough to be irritating. Luckily, at that moment, the square brick building of Kingston Prison appeared. The prison was about three kilometers outside the capital, and it hadn't been touched by the bombing. As with the king's estate, the place was relatively quiet. A few guards had stayed at their posts, but they were quickly dispatched. The prison security system proved a more worthy adversary. The outer double doors were locked and required bio ID to open them. Shit," said Novak, her nose nearly touching the panel. She took a step backward and sized up the door, her hands on her hips. Can you get through? Carla asked. With enough time, we can get through anything. The problem is, we might take out the whole building. Unless you have another suggestion, go for it. I'd like to look Beaumont Smith in the eye, but if I can't, I'll deal with the disappointment. One corner of Novak's lips lifted. It'll be safest if you wait in the car, ma'am. Watching the destruction of the entrance to Kingston Prison would have been more entertaining if the head of the BA's royal family had let up his wailing, but it was not to be. Carla grimly listened to the kid in between the blasts of mortar fire. When Novak approached the car to tell her the route into the prison was now clear, she ordered that the boy be brought with them. The building probably isn't stable," said the commander as they walked back to the rubble remains of the entrance. "But I guess you're set on going inside. Of course I am. Are the prisoners still in their cells? Yes, the guards left them there when they ran off. Do you have a plan for them? Not particularly. I'll think about it." Dust and smoke hung heavy in the atmosphere around the front of the building, and the heat from the blasts radiated from the debris. Carla coughed and her eyes smarted. She lifted the collar of her shirt over her mouth and nose, and gingerly stepped through the shattered concrete and bent iron spread over the ground. Within the prison, the inmates were hollering and screaming and creating quite a cacophony, even at their distance from the entrance.
At least the noise drowned out the muffled sniffles of King Fred. The lights were out, but the helmet lights of Novak and the accompanying soldiers cut into the darkness. We should have the Prime Minister located soon, said Novak. If he's in here, we'll find him. He's here, replied Carla simply. Some things she just knew. It was hard to describe, but it was an ability she'd had as long as she could remember. It was one of the things that had started her on the path to founding the EAC. Every so often an extra sense that other people didn't seem to have. A nameless certainty would strike her. Now was one of those times. She could feel Beaumont Smith somewhere nearby, feel his fear and dread, his rage towards his adversaries, his longing for the perfect, comfortable, powerful life he'd led and that was now gone forever. He stood out to her, a bright bundle of emotions in the darkness, shining out stronger than all the lost souls surrounding him. This way, Carla suddenly said, as they came to a branch in the main corridor. Damn it, said Novak. A closed, reinforced door stood in their way a few metres down. Carla carried on walking until she reached it. She grasped the handle and turned it. Satisfaction surging, she pulled the door open. The departing guards hadn't locked it. They found the BA Prime Minister cowering in the corner of his cell, ineffectively hiding behind his bunk like a three-year-old playing hide-and-seek. You... Your Majesty, he breathed, when, peeking out, he realised they could all see him. One of the soldiers was holding the king by the scruff of his neck. The boy appeared intent on beating the record for a fit of crying, Carla mused, her brows creased. The PM crawled out from his hiding place and got uncertainly to his feet. Addressing the kid, he said, I hope they haven't hurt you. If you've hurt one hair on this child's head, he said to Carla, I'll... What? she snorted derisively. Do you want the honour? she asked Novak. Me? the commander replied. I'd love to. She took her beamer from its holster. This movement sent Beaumont Smith into a frenzy of terror. He fled to the wall of his cell and tried frantically, and rather nonsensically, in Carla's opinion, to climb the walls. He looked rather like an old spider trapped in his own web. Which, she reflected, he was, kind of. It'll hurt less if you don't move, Novak called out. But the old man was beyond any kind of self-control. Abject fear had seized him, and he continued to try to make an impossible escape from his doom. It took three shots to finish him off, and Carla felt a bit sick by the end. That barbecue smell of cooked human flesh was something she'd never grown accustomed to. The kid was now shrieking calamitously, hurting her ears despite his gag. She held out her hand to Novak, who passed over her weapon. She fired, and the noise stopped. That's better. Chapter 37 Wright was like a plushie with all the stuffing taken out. He sagged as he leaned against the bulkhead and then collapsed into a chair. He put his head in his hands and slowly shook it. I can't believe it, he murmured. Then he straightened up. Ignoring Talon and Arthur, he said aghast, Brigadier, is this true? He was coming Colburn. Talon was beside herself with curiosity. She'd never seen Wright react so strongly before. He'd always been the model of self-control and professionalism. Whether faced by a dumb marine who had got her foot trapped between rocks or a raging, violent, sick bay patient, no matter what life threw at him, the Major always kept his cool. This was different. He was listening to Colburn's reply. Arthur was also watching Wright, clearly curious, but he stayed silent. 
The Major suddenly leapt up and strode to the door. Hey, Talon said, what's happened? As if only just remembering there were other people in the cabin, he replied, Military business. Wait here. The door opened and he marched out. Talon turned to Arthur. Stay here. I'll be back soon. But didn't he say? She was already out in the passageway. Wright was a few metres away, moving fast. She ran to catch up to him. He glanced at her with a look of annoyance. I told you to... You said it was military business. I'd like to remind you I am military. Huh. You didn't want to be for a while there. Go back to your mythical friend. He needs someone to look after him. He's obviously mentally ill. Wright was setting such a quick pace she had to trot to keep up. Arthur isn't mentally ill. He's who I said he was. He told you so without any suggestions from me. I never went near him all the time he was learning English, and before then he couldn't understand me, so I couldn't have influenced him. I don't really know he couldn't understand you, do I? You are both speaking foreign languages. I only have your word for it, it wasn't the same one. Talon couldn't think of a suitable response, so she said, This is all beside the point. What's going on? Why are you in such a hurry? His reply was edged with anger. You seem to be forgetting your position, Corporal. Ah, oh, come on. We've been through too much together for that. Though she tried to maintain a casual tone, her heart was in her mouth. She was really pushing it, begging for a charge of insubordination. But she sensed a crack in the Marine's armour. Something had deeply unsettled him, disturbed him to his core. She felt sorry for him. As he had moments earlier in the cabin, he suddenly physically sagged again. There's been a coup, he muttered, on Jamaica. The Chief of Defence is leading it. Talon halted, surprise stopping her in her tracks. Wright strode on ahead, oblivious. She ran to his side. A military coup? We've taken over the BA government. If they're successful, I expect they'll soon be declaring martial law, he said bitterly. Don't you mean we? You were saying, that's the point, isn't it? The Major spat. None of us were consulted on whether we want to take part in this. They've dragged us in, and now we're expected to just support them. It's treason. It's going against... He expelled air heavily, unable to complete his sentence. His chest heaved as if he seemed to fight to control his emotions. I'm going to talk to Colburn, he said at last. We have to decide where the Valiant sits in all of this. Good, I'm coming too. Wright opened his mouth to respond, but then sighed and clamped his lips. He'd probably decided he had enough to contend with without also trying to put her off. Talon was relieved. She didn't like arguing with him, and she was determined to have her input into the decision-making. The fact that Arthur had reappeared at this crisis in the history of the Britannic Isles couldn't be a coincidence. She felt sure he had a role to play, though she didn't know what yet. But he'd only just learned to speak English. He knew nothing about life in modern times. He probably didn't even know he was aboard a starship in space. And he didn't even seem to believe he was finally awake after his long centuries of sleep. He needed an advocate, someone to speak for him in a way that people would understand, as well as to explain to him what was happening. So far, she was the only person who truly believed who he was. She had to be his spokesperson. They'd arrived at Colburn's office. When the door slid open, Talon boldly walked in behind Wright, acting as if she'd been invited. The brigadier looked at her like she was the first example of non-terrestrial intelligent life. We have some other news to tell you, Talon said. It's about the man we picked up in West B.I. Can't it wait? The major paused before replying in a defeated tone. It's probably best she stays. I'll take your word for it, said the brigadier tersely, glowering at Talon. 
She reached for a chair that sat next to the bulkhead and carried it over to Colburn's desk, where she put it down next to Wright's, grateful for his support. I don't know much more than I told you in the comm yet, the brigadier said, addressing Wright. I received this from the Sea Lord. She played a recording on her interface. General communication to the space fleet from Sea Lord Montague. Along with the Chief of Defence Staff, our forces have moved to seize control of the BA government and to take the Prime Minister, Mr Beaumont Smith, into custody, pending an investigation into allegations of corruption, accepting bribes, compromising national security and betraying his oath of office. I'm happy to report that our actions at the new parliament in Jamaica have been successful and as I speak, myself and Lord Hennessy, Chief of Defence Staff, have set up a temporary government to manage domestic, international and space affairs. We have stepped into the breach and will remain in position until such time as we are able to re-establish the safety, security and fair government of all members of the Britannic Alliance. Please stand by to receive further information and instructions. But what about the rest of the MPs? asked Wright, incredulous. If they really believed that about the Prime Minister, that doesn't mean they're all corrupt. They could have demanded a vote of no confidence. Why'd they have to take over the whole government? They didn't, of course, Colburn retorted. It's all nonsense. Beaumont Smith is a waste of space, an awful, bigoted, arrogant, malevolent arsehole. But he isn't corrupt. He doesn't need money and he can't be blackmailed. His family is fabulously rich and it's all stashed in tax havens. And his web of influence spread so widely, he could easily quash any news reports that showed him in a bad light. Then what's this about? Buggered if I know, replied Colburn. She gave a groan of frustration. The Space Navy commanders have been comming each other since we received the news. I haven't said anything to anyone yet. The Valiant is the only Marine starship. Strictly speaking, I should be liaising with the Admiral but I haven't heard from her and I don't know if she's part of this. If she is, I'm not sure what to do. What else can we do except fall in line? Wright asked. We have to follow the chain of command. Yes, we do, the brigadier conceded, though appeared uncomfortable about her reply. Her gaze flicked to Talon. What's this news about the patient in the sick bay? she asked. He isn't there any more, Wright replied. There didn't seem any point, as he's probably the healthiest person on board. I put him in a cabin. And? Or is that it? The Major hesitated. The news is, Talon said. He's... Wait, Colburn said. She was looking at her interface. Something's arrived from the Admiral. She pressed the screen. I suppose it won't hurt for you two to hear it. General communication to the space fleet from Admiral Kim. You all heard the news from Sea Lord Montague. I want to state for the record that I was not informed of this coup prior to its staging and I had no idea what the Chief of Defence Staff and Sea Lord had planned. As you know, I'm new to this post and so this comes at a challenging time. I, and from what I understand, you also, neither concur with nor support the actions of the military heads on Earth. I will draft an official response condemning their behaviour and send it to Jamaica today. Furthermore, after considerable deliberation and consultation with my commanders and captains, I've come to a very difficult and heartfelt decision. From this moment onward, the space fleet will secede from the Britannic Alliance and form its own independent, self-governing entity. We have a long road ahead of us, officers. Your first step is to inform your men and women of my decision. After that, we have many puzzles to solve coming up. But I've already heard some great suggestions and I'm convinced we will meet all future difficulties with our usual determination and vigour. That is all for now. 
Colburn's face was a picture. Chapter 38 The flashes of light in the night sky over Kingston and the accompanying booms were like a grotesque firework display. Hans's drink had grown warm in his hand as he'd watched and listened, unable to believe what was happening. His long years of work, the huge effort he'd put into making his plans, weighing position against position, personality against personality, event against event, his dreams. It had all come to nothing. The news anchor at the station had managed to blurt a few sentences about reports of an attack on St George's before the station blacked out, and a split second later, like thunder following lightning, came an ear-splitting whine. Hans knew that sound too well. Reflexively, he'd thrown himself on the floor, a sweat breaking out over his body as he flashed back to the bombing of the General Council. For a moment he was there again, cowering on the floor as flames roared around him, devouring the wooden building. He tasted the burning smoke, choked on the ashes, was held prostrate by the fallen metal strut. Then he returned to his hillside villa. There was a crack and the sky winked into daylight before night instantly fell again. But the view had changed. In far-off Kingston, something was on fire. The capital had been hit by a bomb or missile. Jamaica was under attack. The enemy had targeted the media station first, cutting off an information source from the local population, and then the next target had been the capital. Hans desperately searched for other news sites, but the net was dead. It hadn't been one news production company the attackers had hit. They'd taken out the internet itself. It made sense. Cutting off communication within target territory was like severing an animal's spinal cord, leaving it unable to move its limbs and defend itself. The interface slipped from his hands and clattered to the floor. Another terrible whine came, and another missile turned night to day as it hit Kingston. He couldn't speak. He could only watch in horror. He reached for his glass and gulped down half the contents, accidentally breathing in some of it. He coughed and choked until he thought he would see his own lungs appearing from his mouth. Eyes watering, gasping for breath, he felt like crying, screaming, running outside and leaping off a precipice. And still the attack went on. All the while... Maria had sat next to him, silent in the darkness. Then, in a pause between missiles, she said, Mr. Jonta, we have to leave. It isn't safe here. They might widen the attack site, and you're an important official in the BA government. They might come looking for you. We must go into hiding. He finally got control of himself. You're right. You're just like your sister, quick thinking and resourceful in a crisis. I must leave. But where can I go? How can I leave the island when it's under attack? I know a place, a safe place, where they'll never find you. Pack a bag quickly and I'll take you there. He moved to put down his glass and in his nervousness knocked over the half-full pitcher, sending a cascade of gin and tonic over the rattan table. The pitcher rolled onto the tile floor and splintered. Leave it, Maria urged. Hurry! As he ran into his house, she followed him, saying, We should travel in my car. It's less noticeable and it can handle rough terrain. We'll have to go off-road. Hans halted in his living room, trying to marshal his thoughts. What should he take? He had some expensive jewellery that might be used for bartering. The invaders would take over the banking system immediately. What else? Bring as much food as you can, said Maria. No, it's OK. I'll pack it. Which way is your kitchen? Through there, he pointed. You'll need loose clothing, tough shoes, a hat and gloves. And empty your medicine cabinet into a bag and bring that too. Medication will be hard to come by. Within five minutes, he'd thrown all she suggested into a duffel bag. 
He'd also opened his safe and taken out his jewellery and important documents, stuffing them into the recesses of his bag. Maria had also been busy. She was waiting for him in the living room with a box overflowing with packets of food. What about water? he asked. There's plenty where we're going. She stepped toward the door, her arms wrapped tightly around the box. They quickly crossed the veranda and descended the steps to the driveway. The night sky had gone and been replaced by a false sunrise, the brilliant red and orange glow coming from the direction of Kingston. Quickly, Mr. Jonter, Maria implored. Hans had paused at the bottom of the steps, overwhelmed once more by the destruction of everything he had longed for. He stared at the remains of Kingston. What had happened to his agents, the MPs, Hennessy, Montague, Beaumont Smith? Had the PM escaped the worst of it, locked in prison? What might become of him? Hans scowled. The Prime Minister would no doubt slither his way out of his predicament somehow. From his birth with a silver spoon in his mouth, he'd always led a charmed life. Maria was tugging on his shirt sleeve. He allowed her to pull him along the driveway until they reached her car. After they'd stowed their bags in the trunk, they climbed into the front seats. Ugh, oh, said Maria, glaring at the black dashboard. I forgot the net is out. Never mind. Put on your seat belt, Mr. Jonter. You can drive? We're about to find out. She started the engine. The headlights came on, and after a few tries, she managed to move the car a few metres along the road. Watch out for the edge, Hans warned, feeling churlish. He wouldn't have done as well as her, but he also didn't want to plunge over the drop. She guided the vehicle closer to the slope on the other side of the road. Slowly, the car's motion grew smoother and faster. They drove higher, and Maria steered them carefully around the curves. I wish I had a straighter road to learn on, she joked. But Hans couldn't join in the banter. Maria, who do you think is doing this? The EAC? The AP? Isn't it both? They were working together to attack the outer islands, and they prevented the space fleet from destroying one of Ua Talman's ships together, didn't they? They did, Hans agreed. But I thought they would scale back their operations. We were on our way to repelling them from Barbados, I thought, and they retreated from the space battle after the loss of the fearless. I advised against that attack, you know. I told Hennessy and Montague it was a bad idea. Ua Talman would rather die than see his project fail, and he would make sure to take the world with him. I told them to concentrate on defending our territories here. But they wouldn't listen. They were a pair of silly men, said Maria. Oh, uh, she glanced at Hans. Don't worry. For what it's worth, I agree with your evaluation. I've worked with enough of the fools to know their type. Privileged upbringings, their families, members of the elite, everything handed to them on a silver platter all their lives. They didn't earn their positions. They were given them, probably as a favour to someone with a lot of influence. I'd hoped to put an end to all that, hoped Hennessy, Montague and Beaumont Smith would be the last of their type with any kind of power. He sighed heavily, lost for words. I guessed you were working towards something, said Maria. I just didn't know what. Don't feel too bad. You did your best. But some things are too hard for one person. There's too much history, too much inertia to fight against all by yourself. You're kind, Maria. I'm so sorry about what happened to Josie. This time he actually meant it. In the burning general council chamber, Josephine had saved his life, and now here was her sister doing the same. He owed the two women so much. Where are we going? he asked, after a few minutes' silence. A cave, about half an hour away. It's somewhere we can shelter while things calm down. It's quite remote and should be safe. 
I can't think of a reason enemy troops would search all the way out there. How did you think of it so quickly? You seem to know immediately where we should go. She only shrugged in reply. They were heading away from the coast, deep into Jamaica's heart, leaving behind the garish glow from the conflagration in Kingston. The night sky began to look more normal. Hans could make out stars in the blackness. Soon, all he could see was the starry sky and the road, illuminated by the car's headlights. This is where we turn, I think, said Maria. She was already slowing the car down. When she turned, Hans thought she'd driven into trackless wilderness, but soon he could make out two worn trails in the vegetation. How do you know of this place? he asked. I've lived in Jamaica all my life. I've been everywhere on the island and many of the other islands. Her answer didn't ring entirely true. Hans had also grown up in one place, but he didn't know every inch of it. The track dipped and the car's nose followed suit. They seemed to be descending into a low valley. Maria eased the vehicle around a sharp curve and immediately braked. It was only just in time. They'd stopped at the edge of a lip that overhung a round hollow. The car's lights lit up the space only faintly. He could make out a wide, low cave mouth on the farther side. A glow came from within. This is it? asked Hans. Yes. She killed the engine and the headlights went out. The light from the cave shone brighter. We'll have to walk from here, follow the path around the edge. But I thought you said we would be alone. Did I say that? I don't think so. There were obviously people living there. As Hans spoke, the inhabitants he'd suspected appeared, black silhouettes moving in the cave mouth, perhaps coming to see who had arrived. There are, Mr. Jonta, but don't worry, they're friends. Come on, this way. Chapter 39 by the time Taylor returned to Arthur's cabin, she was feeling crestfallen. But the sight of the man, released from thousands of years spent in limbo, looking hale and hearty and very much alive, and stroking boots on his lap, lifted her spirits a little. She figured the smile she gave when he saw her must have been half-hearted, for he reacted by asking her if something was wrong. Not something, some things. Many things are very wrong, and I don't know what I can do about any of them. I'm sorry, Talon. Thanks. She slumped into a chair sideways and hung her arm over the back. How are things with you? I didn't get a chance to ask you how you're feeling. That fast learning program seems intense, and have you recovered from all the time you spent in the cave? Though, honestly, apart from looking a bit tired... You look amazing. All that time I spent in the cave, he repeated. How long was that, in your estimation? Um, about 3,500 years, give or take a hundred or so. Didn't Wright tell you, or what we know about you? I suppose not. I told him who I thought you were, who you are, but he doesn't believe me. Three and a half thousand years? Arthur gave a short laugh. This dream is extraordinary. I hope I remember the details when I wake. Uh, your Majesty, you aren't dreaming. This is real life. It's just that a long time passed before we needed you again. Not that it mattered that King Arthur was back. Everything had gone to hell, and she didn't think there was anything he or anyone else could do to put it all right again. Of course this place is real to you, dream creature. How could it be otherwise? This is your world I have created in my mind. And it is a wonderful world. All I've seen has been astounding. And I know there is much more for me to explore. I only hope I don't wake soon. I am astonished I could invent such marvellous ideas. Talon sighed. 
Is there anything I could do, anything that could happen, that would convince you that you aren't dreaming? I don't know. It's interesting that you want to persuade me of it. She wondered if it was important that he didn't understand he'd been revived in a future far distant from his own time, or if not understanding was better. Perhaps his mind was protecting itself because acknowledging the truth would make him insane. Arthur, can I call you that? It feels weird to address you by your proper title. In this imaginary realm, it is acceptable. In my waking days, I don't enjoy the formalities of my position, so your familiar attitude is welcome. She liked him more and more. Arthur, what was it like living in your world? I've heard so many stories about it and about you, but I don't know how true they are. No written accounts survive from your time. The earliest mention we have of you was recorded hundreds of years after your death, or rather your entombment in the mountain, and then later writers rewrote the stories, changing them and embellishing them, injecting their own ideas and values. No one really knows who you are or what you represent anymore, and plenty of people believe you never existed. She thought of Wright, who even though he'd heard the words from the horse's mouth, so to speak, refused to accept it. Hmm, what's it like living in my world? Arthur looked down at the cat on his lap. Boots was sound asleep, totally unimpressed by the fact he was lying on an ancient monarch. I'm not sure how to answer. Your world is very different in many ways. For one thing... If we want to bathe, we must draw the water from a well, spring or stream. Here it appears miraculously, and it's hot without any need for a fire, unless perhaps the fire is somewhere else. The clothes you wear are very soft and comfortable, and so is this bed. I don't think I've slept anywhere so comfortable in my entire life. I could sleep on this bed forever. He smiled and stroked his beard as if in thought. It is a... It's a peaceful world. I like it. But I would like to go outside. I'm curious to see the country around this castle. A peaceful world? Taylor asked. What makes you say that? She couldn't imagine anywhere less peaceful than a military starship... But on the other hand, he hadn't seen her or anyone else suited up, and he might not have understood what was going on when the Valiant had taken part in the recent battle. No one carries a sword or dagger. Even for your weapons training, you only use staves. You can kill with them, I've seen it done, but it's hard. It makes me think you don't really want to hurt each other. Oh! She put her hand over her mouth and chuckled. It was ridiculous, but it made complete sense. Arthur didn't have a clue about any of the pulse weapons he'd seen in the equipment store. He'd also missed the blunt knives, though she doubted that would have altered his misunderstanding. He had so much to learn about his new environment. She felt sad, realising the many ugly surprises he had in store. Where to start? He'd asked about going outside, so it was as she'd suspected. He didn't know he was in space. But showing him that could be a huge shock to his system, despite his belief he was dreaming. She could introduce him to the idea of modern military warfare, however. It would be something he could relate to. I have something to show you, if you can wait a minute. She left him and jogged to the nearest armoury, where she borrowed a suit of armour and a pulse rifle. She would get into trouble if anyone found out, but in the current state of anarchy, she didn't think punishing her would be a high priority. When she returned to Arthur's cabin, she made sure to carry her helmet and not wear it, so he would know it was her. The light of recognition came on in his eyes the minute she entered the room. He understood instantly what she was wearing, and he was interested in examining both the suit and her helmet. She activated the HUD and put the helmet on his head. 
The look of amazement on his face was entertaining, though he couldn't possibly understand what any of the display meant. Next she showed him the pulse rifle and explained as best as she could how it worked, but she didn't think he grasped even the basics of its operation. That was only to be expected. In his time the only energy source was fire. In the end she guessed he might think of it as a kind of flamethrower. I knew you were a knight the moment we began to fight, Arthur said. Your skills are excellent. I had no idea women could fight so well. I wish you were real. I would include you in my company in a heartbeat. I would make a new company, in fact, of elite female knights. You could train them. I am... She didn't bother completing her sentence. She was getting hot in her suit without the aircon activated and she didn't have much more to tell him about it that he would understand. I'm going to take these back, she said. When she returned to the cabin, Arthur was sitting down, poring over the interface set into the tabletop, sweeping it with his fingertips. She peered over his shoulder. He was looking at pictures of Earth. Maybe Wright had been trying to find out where he came from. Are we in one of these places? he asked. Would you show me which one? No, sorry, but I'll explain where we are later. She sat on his bunk. It actually was really comfortable, more so than any other rack she'd slept on in her time in the Royal Marines. Wright must have arranged for a soft mattress to be placed on it. The Major was far nicer than he liked to pretend. Do you mind if I lie down? I don't mind at all, Talon. She turned over his pillow to be polite and then rested her head on it. Tell me more about your time, Arthur. I mean, your nights and what you did. My dad used to tell me stories about you. My nights? They are a group of virtuous and valiant men. It is very difficult to be admitted to my table. As well as being skilled in the military arts, you must be loyal, just, honourable and faithful at all times. You must swear to protect the weak, poor and vulnerable and be prepared to give your life to uphold these values. Why do you ask? Isn't this what is expected of you and your fellow knights? Talon considered for a while before replying. I used to think so. But now I'm not so sure. That's a great pity. Yes, it is. A familiar, deep sadness and longing came over her, and she felt very far from home. Do you know any stories, Arthur? I know many, but I'm no storyteller. Could you tell me one anyway? He smiled indulgently. You are a strange dream creature. Very well. He cleared his throat. There was once a very noble and perfect knight. Talon didn't think she'd ever heard the tale he began to tell her. It must have been one that hadn't survived to reach the ears of the first person to record the history of King Arthur. Nevertheless, she found she couldn't stay awake to listen to it. Her eyes prickled with tiredness and her eyelids grew heavy. Soon, with the soft voice of King Arthur droning in her ears, she drifted off to sleep. Chapter 40 Carla was in full regalia, from her headdress down to her embroidered deerskin slippers. Others might have found the Dweer's costume uncomfortable and unwieldy, and so did she but the downsides were outweighed by the thrill she experienced whenever she wore it. Power seemed to course through her. Power and another feeling she had no single word to describe. She felt as though she could do mysterious, impossible things, as if she could tap into a second layer of reality and perform feats that the ignorant would call magic. There had been times when she'd believed she might have really succeeded in reaching that dark layer beneath the surface that others perceived as reality. The Knight of Perrin's conception was one such time. 
That evening, in the oak grove, more than mere seed had been deposited inside her. Something else had entered her, and later it had entered the embryo that would become her son. There was something otherworldly about him, something perhaps not quite human. She had also felt herself touching the other side of the abyss when she had reached out to Ua Talman when she needed him as an ally, seducing him with her mind, bending him to her persuasion. She couldn't prove it, and he would never admit it to her, but something told her she'd achieved her goal. Now, though she thought she'd been successful at manipulating Lorcan, she would not be attempting the same task again. She had no more need for him. The BA had finally fallen and all their remaining lands would soon be hers. The main opposition to the EAC was vanquished. It was time to celebrate. Novak had suggested the site for the festival. Like all Earth Awareness rituals, it would be held outdoors and far from artificial constructions. The commander had found a suitable place on the outskirts of a forest and a conveyance was awaiting to take Carla there. She walked out of the bedroom where she'd dressed and descended the carpeted stairs to the first floor. The posthumous King Frederick's mansion had proven a convenient and luxurious abode since the invasion of Jamaica, even though the place sometimes reminded her of the snivelling brat. She'd sent for Perrin to join her there, hoping his presence would help dispel the unpleasant memory of the deceased B.A. monarch. Outside, a limousine was waiting that would take her the paved distance to the site before she would transfer to an off-road vehicle to complete the journey. Her stomach churned with excitement. She arrived at the Victory Celebration site three hours after sunset. Novak had chosen well. The ground was wooded, but the trees were not so thick that they obscured the view badly. By moving around, everyone would see the main spectacle. In the darkness, many figures moved. The area was thronged with attendees. Carla wasn't so interested in the opening event. It was what came after that would make the evening fun for her. However, everyone would expect tradition to be followed, so she couldn't skip it. A cheer went up as the EAC troops and auxiliaries noticed she'd arrived. Carla couldn't deny she did like the general adulation. What leader of a spiritual organisation did not? But she knew it didn't drive her. She was no fake. She believed in what she did with every fibre of her being, probably more so than anyone else present, more than anyone on the planet. The sea of men and women parted in two waves, moving to her left and right and creating a path for her to follow across the trampled grass. She set off slowly and gracefully, careful not to move unevenly and make her headdress wobble. At the end of the path, a structure could be seen in the torchlight. It stood about five metres tall and two metres across at its widest point. Four legs supported a central egg-shaped chamber. All was constructed from interlaced slim branches and twigs, like a wicker basket, but more open. As she got closer, she could see the figures of two men inside. Their forms were black against the general darkness, and they were sitting down together, perhaps clutching each other. Carla couldn't tell in the gloom. She knew their names. Hennessy and Montague. According to her source, they were the engineers of the military coup, the final distraction and additional weakness that had spurred her to launch her attack. If the BA had anyone to blame for their defeat, it was probably these two. Consequently, despite the few local inhabitants who had so far resisted her attempts at extermination, she doubted anyone would be along to save them. Just in case she was wrong, she'd stationed guards around the perimeter of the site. Dwyer Orr! shouted a voice from the natural cage. 
One of the prisoners had spotted her. Please, he called, please let us out of here. We haven't drunk or eaten a thing for two days. This is inhumane treatment, contravening the rules of legitimate warfare. We are your captives, but you must treat us fairly and attend to our basic needs. This is outrageous behaviour, said a second voice from the cage. We demand to be released and taken to a normal prison. Then you must contact our families, who will pay a large ransom for our return. You may name your price, Dweer. It will be yours. She halted near the base of the structure, smirking. What a pair of idiots! as if she had any desire or need for money. They didn't remotely understand her or the EAC and had clearly never tried. Safely ensconced in bubbles all their lives, they'd never had any interest for anything except what would bring them more fame and riches. With these two in control, it was no wonder the Alliance had fallen. It had never stood a chance. She faced her people. A hush fell upon them. I am the wind on the sea. I am the wave on the shore. I am the oak in the forest. I am the eagle on the mountain. I am the lightning in the storm. I am the blossom on the tree. I am a wolf in the winter. I am a salmon in the river. I am a spring on the plain. I am the word of power. I am the spear in battle. I am the bringer of fire. Who spreads light in the gloaming? Who can tell the ages of the stars? Who can tell where the dead live again? A soft sigh, as if a collective breath had been held and let out, came from the audience. She turned to face the captives. Staring up at them, she blindly held out a hand. The handle of a torch was placed in it. Dweer, called the first man who had spoken. What are you doing? Didn't you hear what my friend said? We demand to be released. We insist upon it, in fact. She strode the final few steps to one of the four legs. What are you doing? The second voice echoed the first, fear raising his intonation to a squeak. Look, if you're trying to scare us, you've succeeded. We'll tell you anything you want to know. Anything. We would have anyway. There's no need for... Oh, my God! Carla had bent down and held the torch to the woven branches that made up the leg. After two days in the Jamaican sun, the wood had dried out fairly well. The flames quickly took hold and licked up the strut toward the central cage. Christ, no! One of the men screamed. You can't! You can't! Help! Let me out! The speaker began to scale the inside of the egg and quickly reached the top, but he could go no farther. He continued to shout and plead, madly reaching through the gaps and trying to pull them apart. The other man hollered and cried and then began to cough. Fire was spreading across the bottom of the cage. The noise of it entwined with the men's cries of agony. Carla turned and lifted her hands high in the air. The crowd roared. Now it was time for the real celebration to begin. Over the last two days, the city and country had been scoured for wine, spirits, beer and luxury foods, and the festival organisers had brought all that had been found out to the woods. There would be far more than those chosen to attend could possibly consume, but that was the entire point. It was a celebration of excess, a festival of mutual thanks from the participants to the earth, and the earth to them for her glorification. And it wasn't only food and drink that were to be indulged in to excess. A while after the drinking had begun, Carla felt an arm slide around her waist, and a hand took her chin to turn it toward questing lips. She kissed the person back. Was it Novak or someone else? She couldn't tell, and she didn't really care. 
Another hand slid up her back and then around her front, feeling for her breasts. Her headdress slipped from her head and fell to the ground. She felt more hands. They grabbed her. They were lifting her up and carrying her away, away from the bright torches and into the dark spaces between the trees. More hands were already tugging at her clothes. At her first celebration, as the new dweer, she'd been scared of this part, frightened that someone would hurt her. She hadn't understood then what she understood now. She was theirs, sacred, precious, to be cherished and revered. She would never come to any harm, not from her devotees nor any other living being, except one. The disagreeable thought intruded into her state of bliss. She still hadn't found and destroyed the single real threat to the EAC. But she could think about it tomorrow, not tonight. Tomorrow, she would also embark on the next logical step of her plan. Now that the AP had served its purpose as an ally, it was time to turn on it. Ua Talman's project had outstayed its welcome on Earth. It had to go. Carla was laid gently down on a prepared bed of grass and flowers, and her mind returned to the present and the joyous celebration. The night was young. Chapter 41 The cornflower's nose dipped, which meant they'd entered Earth's stratosphere. Talon tightened her grip on her pulse rifle and looked up at Wright, who sat on the bench opposite her. She could just about make out his eyes through the tint of his visor. He had his gaze on the corvette's aft hatch, from where they would emerge onto Jamaican soil. The last time she'd gone on a mission, she'd nearly been left for dead and ended up with a broken back. Would this time turn out any better? It wasn't likely. Wright's attention had turned to her. They held eye contact for several seconds before he looked away. What was he thinking? Was he blaming her for Colburn's decision since hearing about the attack on Jamaica? Or was he grateful for the forthcoming battle, the chance to go out fighting for something he believed in? The only alternative for the Marines on the Valiant was to secede from the BA with the rest of the fleet and eke out an existence spent drifting in space, scrounging for food, water and energy. It would be like how things had been after she'd made it to Ireland. Unable to find her children, crammed into an overcrowded refugee camp, barely able to find enough food to survive. Life had no longer seemed worth living. Enlisting had seemed the only escape. She'd figured at least that way she might do some good and put right the terrible wrongs the EAC had done to her people. Had she done any good in her time in the Royal Marines? She wasn't sure. Turbulence hit them and lifted the cornflower high, then just as rapidly dumped her low. Again the corvette rode the roller coaster, and then again, each time sending her stomach up into her throat and down into her intestines. A nudge from an elbow. A batcher. She'd forgotten her friend was sitting by her side. Her nerves must be really getting to her. He pushed his helmet against hers so they could speak without using com, which others could listen in on. No puking, little chick. I'll be okay. You look after yourself, big man. I just thought of a Shang-Chi strategy that'll blow your mind. You'll never outmaneuver me now. Ha! I'll believe it when I see it. A pause stretched out, but Talon didn't move her helmet away from her friends. Before the thought had formed properly in her mind, she blurted, Do you think we'll get back to the Valiant? As she spoke, she realised her nervousness wasn't for herself as much as it was for Arthur. With all that was going on in the world, there was little chance she would ever find her children. They were already orphans in spirit, if not in fact, and she had to trust that someone, somewhere, had taken pity on them and was bringing them up as best they could. So whether she lived or died no longer really mattered. But what about Arthur? What would he do if she were killed? 
he would never survive alone in her world. If the shock of reality hitting didn't kill him, his utter unpreparedness would. Skill at fighting with staves didn't count for much in the 23rd century. Who knows, a batcher replied. The bigger question is, if we do survive, will the Valiant be there for us to return to? He had a point. Colburn was acting alone without the support of the rest of the fleet. The Valiant was well equipped, but she was no match for the entire combined AP and EAC space forces. It was true that the Brigadier had had the lucky break of her life when they'd arrived. For some unknown reason, the majority of the EAC fleet was absent, and the handful of AP ships in Earth's vicinity had ignored the BA ship's arrival. Yet the Valiant would still be hard put to fight off the EAC space attack. Her odds were now better than impossible, but only just. Talon, said Abacha, not using the nickname he'd given her, not even calling her Ellis, so she knew he was in earnest. Have you thought about what you'll do if things don't go our way? If it looks like we're going to lose, what else can we do? We carry on fighting. He moved away from her and straightened up, looking ahead, but his eyes were unfocused. Then he leaned over until their helmets touched again. My family is from the Caribbean, he said. Not Jamaica, St Kitts. But I know the islands. I know how to get around, the backwoods places where it's easy to hide. In the warm climate, you don't need a lot to survive. And you and I, we've been trained to rough it. She stared at him. What are you suggesting? I don't think I need to put it into words. Just something to think about. Rocked to her core, she jerked her helmet away, breaking contact. Desertion? The man sitting beside her had suddenly become a stranger. She'd thought she knew him. She'd thought her friend was brave, loyal and trustworthy. She'd been wrong. Hadn't what Arthur had said meant anything to him? She could remember the king's speech like he'd given it five minutes ago. It had been her idea to get him to talk to Colburn's marines and crew. She wasn't sure why she'd suggested it, except for the fact it seemed the BA had lost its way and that Arthur's beliefs and values were what was missing. Trying to restore them might do some good. Colburn had only agreed because she was desperate and didn't know what else to do. She'd ordered everyone aboard the Valiant and Cornflower to gather in the Valiant's largest gym, leaving a skeleton crew aboard the corvette. Even the biggest gym wasn't enough to accommodate everyone. They'd stood shoulder to shoulder, crowded the gallery and leaned in at the doors. Then Arthur had arrived. He edged through the crowd so unassumingly, Talon didn't think anyone knew he was the speaker until he stepped onto the platform. His red-gold hair made him stand out, but his expression was modest. He began to speak, but softly, so that they all had to be quiet to hear him. He'd spoken about honour, integrity and goodness and what they meant to him. The terms and examples he used were hard to understand at first, but if you really thought about them, his points became clear. He told them of the things his knights had done, acts that were selfless and virtuous, and how much they had sacrificed to stay true to their cause. He described their benevolence and kindness, their courage and valour. As he spoke, his esteem and love for these men long dead shone through his words, and Talon was reminded of the awe with which her father had recounted their tales. As the king neared the end of his speech, she found herself weeping. Finally, Arthur had said, I do not know who you all are or what place I am in. This dream continues so long, I begin to fear it is no dream at all and that I am somehow in a strange new world. But one thing I do know, you are men and women, the same as my people. Though a chasm separates us, inside you are the same as me and my folk. 
You share their needs and wants, their desires and fears. If you have listened and understood what I have told you, and if you hold these ideas in your minds and hearts in everything you do and say, you may one day be as honourable and valiant as my knights. Had the speech had any effect on the listeners? Talon thought it was more than likely most of them thought he was mad and talking nonsense. But Colburn had been affected, and so had Wright. She saw a new resolve and conviction in their faces, and the uncertainty and doubt they'd shown for weeks had gone. The brigadier had waited two hours before broadcasting a comm to all personnel, saying that she'd proposed to the new admiral that the space fleet go to the rescue of the BA citizens trapped in the Caribbean, but her proposal had been shot down. The admiral reportedly replied it was everyone for themselves now, as Hennessy and Montague had demonstrated when they enacted their military coup without consulting anyone except their cronies. The subsequent invasion of the Caribbean was their own fault, in the Admiral's opinion, and though the devastation to the local population was regrettable, she wouldn't risk any of her personnel to correct others' mistakes. So you see, said Colburn, if we try to help our people in the Caribbean, who are probably being hunted down and murdered as I speak, we're going to be on our own. I want to do it, and so does Major Wright, but neither of us is willing to order you to undertake a suicide mission. I'll give you an hour to think about it, then we'll take a vote. If the majority votes in favour, anyone who doesn't want to participate will be ferried to the moon station on our way to Earth. Talon voted immediately, hoping but not certain that anyone would vote the same way. When the results came in, it was clear that Arthur had reached them. Now they were on their way to Earth, and she didn't know why a Batcher hadn't elected to take the moon option if he was so convinced they would fail. Perhaps he'd been worried he'd be stranded there with no way to get home. For the rest of the ride, she didn't speak to her friend again. Just before they touched ground, he spoke to her a final time. Don't discount what I told you, Tay. If the situation becomes hopeless, remember what I said. I'll wait to hear from you, but only for a little while. A sharp bank to the left sent her sliding sideways, and then soft judders vibrated down the cornflower. The corvette was under fire, no doubt from EAC anti-aircraft batteries in Jamaica, and she was firing back. Talon clung to her harness, preparing to be slung around as the pilot jinked the ship to avoid being hit. The plan had been to come in low and fast, which would make her harder to hit, but she had to get down low first. The vessel plummeted like a stone, so fast for a second Talon wondered if the engines had been taken out. The fall seemed to take forever, then they powered forward, all the marines crushed into each other in spite of their restraints. The ship had swerved sharply several times during the descent, but she seemed to have dodged the worst the EAC could throw at her. Her thrusters roared and Talon was thrown in the opposite direction. The thump of landing would have jolted Talon right out of her seat if it hadn't been for her harness. At Wright's order, she unclipped her harness and leapt up to join the line preparing to disembark. Outside, the midday sun glared down and her visor instantly dimmed, turning the world darker and highly defined. Data flashed up on her HUD, conditions, a map of the terrain and who within her field of view was friend and who was foe. She was running up a wide, sandy beach. A ridge overlooked the shoreline and from several spots along it smoke was rising. She guessed they were the sites of armaments the corvette had destroyed. She could also spy the shell of a building peeking out above the ridge line. It had to be the place they were aiming for, and so the corvette should have spared it, but it had been reduced to walls, blown-out windows, and ragged reminders of the people who had once lived there. Well, that was one place the Dweer wasn't at. Damn it! 
Hostiles on the ridge, twelve o'clock, Wright barked, exactly as the pulses began to rain down. The cornflower hadn't managed to wipe out all the opposition. At the major's signal, Talon headed for the area where the ridge flattened out to meet the beach. Several paths cut into the slope among the long grass. She ran up one of them, peering ahead, trying to find the source of the pulse fire. On another trail, someone got hit, fell and tumbled down onto the sand. He was squirming, still alive, his suit breastplate blackened and smoking. Whispers of pulse bolts unleashed on the EAC defenders. She saw one. A helmet had bobbed into and out of view and a single shot had fired. Keeping her rifle aimed on the spot, she carried on running. Randomly, she squeezed the trigger. The soldier bobbed up again into the bolt's path. He didn't reappear. Marines were cresting the ridge, picking off the EAC troops. There didn't seem to be many and they were falling back. As she reached the top, she saw Wright run up to one of the injured, a man lying on his back, writhing in pain from a wound that had almost severed his leg. The Major knelt down beside him and unclipped and pulled off the wounded soldier's helmet. "'Where's the Dweer? he asked. "'Is she on the island?' The man's face was deathly white and slick with sweat. He closed his eyes and jammed his lips together, shaking his head. His blood pooled around him. Tell me, Wright insisted. You're going to die anyway. Still, the soldier refused to answer. Medic, yelled the Major. Then, to the wounded man. If I give you something for the pain, will you tell me the Dweer's location? Finally, he spoke. Yes, he gasped. Yes, I'll, I'll tell you. Wright nodded at the medic who had arrived at his side. After hastily scrabbling in her supplies, she pulled out a pressure hypodermic and touched it to the soldier's bloody exposed thigh. He screamed. She fired the syringe and the man's rigid body relaxed. His eyes opened. Before the Major could even repeat his question, the EAC soldier spat at him. The gob of spittle hit his visor and ran down. If Wright said something in reaction, he kept it to himself, turning off his external comm. He stood up. At his feet, the wounded man's body shuddered and was still. The Major took out his canteen and squirted water over his visor. We're going to search all the sites on our list until we find her, he said. Talon groaned. They'd been given eight places the Dweer might be using as her base. Going to all of them would take so long the EAC would be bound to catch up to them and capture or kill them before they could escape on the cornflower. Unless they gave up on their mission, they were truly screwed. She thought again of Abacha's suggestion, but firmly pushed the idea aside. After what Arthur had said, she knew she could never take him up on his offer. A tall marine was walking up the line. It was her friend as if her thoughts had called him. He approached the Major, and for a minute the two stood in private conference. By a small motion of his helmet, she saw Wright agree to something, and then his order came, Get ready to get back to the ship. We're going to the Royal Estate outside Kingston. They got aboard the Cornflower just in time. As the corvette took to the air, the beach beside her exploded, and the shock wave knocked her sideways but the pilot had put sufficient space between them and the ground to avoid crashing into it. A few tens of kilometres was no distance to the vessel, and before Talon had a chance to ask a batcher what made him think the Dweer would be at the royal estate, they'd landed. The plan was the same simple steps, run out, kill the hostiles, search for the EAC leader. This time, however, they encountered a strong defence. They'd landed within the estate grounds, so they were surrounded by enemy troops. Soldiers approached from behind, moving in from the gates and perimeter fence, and they were pouring out from the mansion. The firing began as the first marines left the ship. They fought their way forward, taking out the foremost of their attackers, but it was hard going. 
They were forced to leave injured comrades on the ground in their battle to reach the building, hoping medics remaining on the cornflower could drag them aboard before the ship left. The strength of the resistance was both a good and a bad sign. The place the Dweer had taken for herself on Jamaica would be well defended, so it looked like a batcher could be right. On the other hand, the place the Dweer had taken for herself on Jamaica would be well defended, so their attack might not succeed. Despite the danger, Talon was struck by the appearance of the house. It was similar to the old stately homes of the B.I., huge, many-windowed and solid. She was sure a batcher had guessed right. Chapter 42 Bitch! spat Lorcan. He'd known Dweer Orr was trouble from the start. Why, oh why, had he entered into an alliance with her? He could have predicted this would happen. Hell, he'd known it would happen, deep down, right from the beginning. How could he have been so stupid? She'd caught him off guard, and it had been entirely preventable. He watched the pinpricks of light that represented the approaching EAC fleet on the display in the Brez's control room. Sir, said Jura hesitantly, perhaps you should... The juggling ball Lorcan had launched with a flick of his wrist hit the man between the eyes. Don't tell me what to do! It was obvious what he had to do. It was only that he was furious at himself for ever countenancing the Dweer's proposal and about the time, money and resources that defeating the EAC ships would entail. Why couldn't the evil witch leave him alone for another few years? Then the project would be finished and she would never see him or a colony ship ever again. That had been their agreement. He'd been a fool for imagining she would stick to it. Mustering his considerable willpower, he put a lid on his anger and returned to his seat. He opened a comm to the admiral of his fleet. Bujold. Yes, sir? Thank you for your message. We also see the EAC ships. Only awaiting your orders, sir. You have free reign, admiral. Have at them. Don't hold anything back. I want those vessels wiped from space. Understood, sir. Sir? Yes. Are you aware a BA starship has entered Earth orbit? No, I was not. He'd thought they'd all pissed off into interplanetary space. It's just one, the Valiant. She's, a. Uh, she's under fire from the few EA ships there. Right? So? So, we have two battleships stationed at Earth... I was wondering... I see what you mean. What was it the Dweer had said? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Two could play at that game. I understand your proposal. Stand by for my answer. Meanwhile, you know what to do. He asked his comm officer to hail the Valiant's commander. A few moments later, she provided him with a vidlink and told him the Valiant's commander was Brigadier Colburn, a harassed-looking old woman with a thin fuzz of white hair coating her scalp appeared on the screen. Ua Talman, she said. I'm rather busy here. I'd appreciate it if you would be brief. Beyond her, the bridge of her ship could be seen, along with her officers at their consoles. It was clear from their expressions they were facing the fight of their lives. I won't take up too much of your time, he replied, but I am curious as to why you've placed yourself in such a dangerous position. My question isn't frivolous. Colburn's face was blank as the time lag passed before his reply reached her. Then she scowled, but as she heard his final sentence, her brow cleared into something like hopefulness. We're attempting to free Jamaica from EAC control. You know what they do to the citizens of the countries they invade. And you're attempting this alone? Again, the lag passed. Now she looked irritated. 
I'm sure your data tells you that. If you have nothing more to say, I must go now. Lorcan did have more to ask her, such as why the hell the rest of the BA space fleet wasn't taking part in the assault, and, considering the circumstances, if Colburn had some kind of death wish and she wanted to take everyone in her command with her. He forbore. Before you go, he said, I have a proposal. Despite my previous alliance with the EAC, now there is little love lost between us. I'd like to offer you the services of the two ships I have in your vicinity. In exchange, if your venture is successful, I want the BA to allow the continued operations of the Barracuda Sea Mine without harassment. He awaited her reply, expecting immediate agreement. The woman was in no position to quibble. However, what she said was, I'm not able to agree to those terms. What? But you're about to... As he watched, a shudder ran through the Valiant. Had the ship taken a hit, or was she firing? Behind the brigadier, the officers looked terrified. Oh, very well, said Lorcan, after a moment's consideration. My ships will lend you their support. He hated the thought of committing his vessels and crews to helping the Valiant without the prospect of getting anything in return. But he hated the Dwyer more. And it was obvious that if he didn't do something soon, the BA ship would be lost. Also, much as he begrudged the feeling, he couldn't deny his conscience was pricked. Colburn and her men and women were only trying to save their compatriots from slaughter, at the dire risk of their own lives. His reply had reached its target. Relief swept over her haggard features. Thank you, Uatalman. Now I really must... Yes, I understand, he replied, closing the vid link and cutting off her response. Nothing more was needed to be said. Contenting himself with the knowledge that even if Colburn hadn't agreed to any kind of recompense for the services she was about to receive, he could nevertheless use them as leverage in later negotiations, he asked for a link to his admiral. Please inform all your commanders stationed at Earth that they are to defend the BA ship from the EAC attack. I was hoping you would say that, sir, she replied. I'll relay your message immediately. And, if I might say so, I think you're choosing the right side. I never trusted that woman, the Dweer. Thanks for your opinion, Lorcan replied icily before closing the comm. Chapter 43 It was hopeless. They were hemmed in from all sides. Even if the cornflower managed to land in the mansion's grounds again without being blown to pieces, they would never reach her. As soon as they left the house, they would be mowed down by the EAC troops outside. More EAC soldiers were arriving too. It was going to be a massacre. Still, with marines stationed at the windows keeping back the attackers for now, Wright had insisted they continue searching the house. Talon guessed he had a point. If the Dweer was here, they could use her as a hostage and get her army to back off. But the woman was nowhere to be found. Talon had searched the attic with a batcher, stepping between thick old wooden beams, peering through clouds of dust their movements puffed into the air. There had been plenty of interesting things to see in that dark place, boxes filled with the relics of hundreds of years of occupation, heirlooms of generations of inhabitants, paintings mouldering in their frames, books infested with insects, trunks that had once contained clothes but were now mostly mouse nests. But no dweer. You know, Abacha said, as they descended the ladder after their fruitless search, there's still a chance we could get away. What chance? asked Talon. The place is surrounded. I don't mean all of us. I saw... Not this again! Hear me out. He'd reached the bottom of the ladder and talked to Talon as she climbed down after him. 
There's some cover near the back of the house, a shrubbery outside the window. It leads to an overgrown orchard, and that reaches all the way to the fence. If the whole platoon were to try to leave that way, they would soon be spotted. But a couple of us keeping low, we might make it. I don't get it. If you want to desert, why did you suggest to the major that we came here? I thought catching the Dwyer was the only chance we had, but she isn't here. It's the end of the road for us if we don't do something, and I'm not ready to die. Not for the BA, not for anyone. Taylor felt a twinge of pity, though she was disappointed in her friend. She didn't want to die either, and certainly not for the BA. She had seen its ugly side, and she didn't view it in the same way any more. But there was more to life than simply staying alive. I'm not running away because the odds look bad," she said. "If Wright had thought that in West B I, I wouldn't be here. He knew he was right then, and he does now. I'm not talking about right and wrong. I'm talking about survival." They had crossed the landing to the uppermost floor. The major had given the order to assemble in the ballroom on the first floor after they had finished their search. The room was in the centre of the house and had no windows, so it offered protection from the attack. If you want to make a run for it, be my guest," said Taylor bitterly. "I won't tell anyone, but leave me out of it." A batcher didn't reply. They descended the stairs without speaking a word to each other and walked across the wide hall, heading for the bathroom. Hisses of pulse fire were coming from all around as the EAC forces pressed in on the house. The Marines at the windows were doing a good job of keeping them back, but eventually the power packs in their rifles would fail while the EAC could resupply. The ballroom was getting busy as others also returned from their unsuccessful searches. Wright was there, his hands on his hips, his visor up, looking defeated. Taylor put distance between herself and Abacha, thinking if he was going to try to make his escape, she was too disgusted with him to say goodbye. She decided to speak to the major. He looked better with his helmet covering that tuft of hair that always stood up on the crown of his head. She wondered if he knew about it. He was a good guy, though he was too in love with the military for his own good. And he never seemed to believe anything she said. Hey, she said as she reached him. He replied sternly, "Corporal, come on, can't we talk to each other as friends for once? How much longer do we have?" His rigid bearing softened. It might not be as bad as it looks. I just heard from Colburn the Valiant found an unexpected ally. The AP has come to her defence, and they're currently going at it with the EAC ships. That's great news for them, not so great for us, unless the Valiant can beam us aboard like in the Sims. I don't know whether to ask the Cornflower's pilot to attempt a landing. His brow furrowed. It would be madness, but it's the only chance we've got. If even a few of us could make it out to her. He'd probably do it, but she didn't bother stating the obvious. I know it's never going to work. No one would make it ten meters from the door before they were shot down, and it must already be too late anyway. We're due an air strike any minute. I keep expecting the EAC troops to withdraw. Taylor sucked in a breath as a true understanding of the situation hit her. What? Wright asked. She's here, she. Dwyer Orr is still here. We've been searching for her for ages, but her soldiers have only kept up a pulse fire attack when they could have launched grenades or mortars or just bombed us. She didn't manage to get out when we arrived. Shit! I think you're right. He began sending a com, telling everyone to keep on looking, to go back to the places they'd searched and search again, to tear the place apart. A marine near one of the ballroom walls turned too fast and clumsily knocked over a Grecian-style statue. 
The white marble figure tumbled heavily onto the polished tiles. A crack echoed from the walls and the statue broke into several pieces. But that wasn't what everyone was looking at. Behind the space where the statue had stood crouched a woman in a long black dress. For a breathless second, everyone froze. Then she bolted. Taylor didn't think she'd ever seen anyone move so fast. The dwyer flew across the room like she had wings on her heels. She ran diagonally across a corner, confusingly not heading for the door. The unexpectedness of her direction caused the marines to freeze for another second in surprise. It was enough time for her to reach the wall. As she touched the spot she was aiming for, Taylor saw a very faint outline in the wallpaper and two cuts in the decorative rail. There was a secret door. She shouted a warning, but the dwyer had pushed it open and was disappearing inside. Meanwhile, hisses came from the direction of the main entrance to the ballroom. No one had noticed that the EAC soldiers had finally managed to get inside the house. Pulse bolts were streaming in from the doorway, cutting through the marines like scythes. They turned and began to fire back. Talon ran for the secret door. The passageway was pitch black. She lowered her visor and her night vision activated. Rough pitted brick walls rose on each side of a space only a metre wide. The floor was brick too, though uneven. Thick ragged cobwebs hung down, recently broken where the dwyer had passed through them. They flapped lazily in a mild breeze. The passageway led to an exit somewhere outside. Her helmet was picking up the sound of soft footsteps ahead, though they were hard to hear over the noise she was making herself. She guessed Weir Orr had tried to leave via the secret passage when the Marines had arrived and hadn't quite made it. She had been waiting, trapped behind the statue, while Wright stood just a short distance away, unable to make it the final few metres. Well, she was still not going to escape. Talon sped up. Her target couldn't be very far ahead. She lifted her pulse rifle and fired speculatively. The flare wiped out her vision for a moment, but that was the only result. The dwyer had to be farther away than she thought, or the passage curved. She noticed it had begun to slope downward. Did it go underground, to travel beneath the gardens and perhaps emerge outside the fence? She didn't know a lot about these old homes of the aristocracy. Whatever, the dwyer was not getting away. Talon fired again and lost her vision again for a quarter second. She strained her ears, listening to her helmet's audio. The faint footsteps had stopped. Now all she could hear was her own heavy tread. Her chest tightened. Had she lost her? Something heavy smashed into her back and she was flung forward and down. Before she could rise, the thing hit her again, but this time she heard the crack of her armour splitting and agony burst in her kidneys. She shrieked. The dwyer must have been hiding in an alcove waiting for her to approach. Whatever was embedded in her back was ripped out again, jerking her body and flooding her with new pain. Summoning all the energy she could, Talon shifted to one side, cramming herself against the wall. A metallic thunk hit her ears. The dwyer had missed with her third blow. Her nerves screaming, Talon twisted around. Throughout her ordeal, her hand had remained fastened on her rifle. The dwyer's robed figure loomed over her, holding something long and pointed. One of the things that hold torches on walls? Talon was already firing, aiming vaguely in the direction of the woman. Pulses flew out, filling the passage with light. The dwyer looked monstrous, and the expression on her face as flashes threw it into relief was terrible. Talon was in too much pain. She could barely cling to her rifle, let alone aim it. Her shots were going wide. The long, sharp object lifted once more, her blood dripping from its tip. If the dwyer pierced the front of her armour, she'd kill her. With a cry of effort, Talon wrenched her arm over her body and fired again. She heard a screech. 
She'd hit the dwyr. Fire erupted from the woman's robes and her makeshift weapon clattered to the floor beside Talon's head. Issuing an awful scream, the dwyr ran off down the passage, her arms thrust over her head, trailing flames. Then she was gone, only the smoke of her burning clothes and flesh remaining. Talon couldn't move. Hot liquid was seeping out beneath her, soaking her skin. Her body was a ball of agony, worse even than the time Wright had blown her free from the boulders. She couldn't breathe. A great weight seemed to be pressing on her lungs. She was looking down a tunnel. All she could see was the brick ceiling above her where spiders crawled. Her vision was darkening and she didn't think it had anything to do with her visor. She didn't want to die. Not yet. She wanted to see her kids again. Somehow, just one more time. She couldn't give up on them. They would never know what had become of her. Blackness encroached, and she felt the thread of life slipping from her grasp. Footsteps. Her gasps halted. The dwyr was coming back. She'd doused the flames, and she was returning to finish her off. Talon tried to lift her rifle, but her arm was useless and wouldn't obey her. Only, she realised, the footsteps were not soft. They were not the soft tread of a woman, but heavy, running, booted feet. It was the sound of soldiers. The EAC must have fought their way into the ballroom, and now they were coming down the secret passage to find their dwyer. They might stop to kill the marine dying in the passage, or they might not bother and let nature take its course. But the footsteps were those of just one soldier. Or was it a marine? Wright must have seen her run into the opening in the wall. Had he come after her? The footsteps stopped. Her vision fading, she couldn't make out the shadowy form leaning over her. Someone removed her helmet. Little chick, you look bad. I'll carry you. He knelt down and eased his arms under her. As he lifted her, she cried out. She couldn't help it. He took care to avoid jolting her body or bumping her against the walls, but the pain was still so bad she could barely speak. You came to find me, she whispered. I wasn't going to leave without you. But what, what about surviving? I thought about it, but some things are more important. So he had understood Arthur, after all. Chapter 44 Gentle hands peeled Carla's charred robes from her body lifting off with them great strips of blackened skin. The pain was beyond anything she'd ever experienced, beyond any agony she'd ever imagined, yet it paled in comparison with her wrath. Someone had hurt her, hurt her who could not be hurt. They had done the impossible. How could it have happened? When she'd tried to kill the soldier pursuing her, she'd known she might not succeed. She had, after all, a weak body. Her strength lay in her mind and spirit. But it had never entered her head that she might be harmed in return. The fact defied her comprehension. This salve will ease the pain, dear, said one of those attending her. A cool sensation arose from her thighs. I have something that will allow you to sleep while we complete your treatment, said another. No, Carla murmured. Her voice sounded strange, like the scrape of sandpaper on wood. No, I want to see. She tried to rise onto her elbows, but her arms were too stiff and gave an agonised protest to her efforts. Dwyer, please lie still. She grimaced. Her face felt strangely tight. I must see, she croaked. See what? She'd emerged from the secret passage on the other side of the perimeter wall. The rest was hazy. 
but she'd thought someone had grabbed her and thrown her onto the damp ground, covering her with their own body and putting out the fire engulfing her. As far as she could tell, only a short time had passed. The fighting was still going on within the mansion. She needed to see what was happening. She needed to know that the person who had shot her would not survive. After the outrage that had been inflicted on the body of the Dweer, her assailant could not be permitted to live. See, the battle. A flurry of whispers ran between her helpers. I am your Dweer, she gasped. Yes, yes, Dweer, of course. She was lying on a stretcher and she felt it being lifted up. The view overhead changed from the low canopy of trees to open sky and scudding clouds. A light rain sprinkled her face. Strains of fighting arrived on the wind. The fizz of pulse rifles firing, running, groans of injured soldiers. And then an explosion roared out. Now you aren't inside. Our soldiers are storming the mansion, said the person attending her. Lift me up. Carla said. Murmurs came from those around her. She heard someone say, I don't know where to touch her. Touch me anywhere, damn it! I must see! A hand slid under each of her shoulders and grasped her under her arms. The person's touch was gentle. Nevertheless, she bit back a scream. As she was levered up, the fence bordering the estate grounds appeared in her view, and in the distance stood the stone façade of the mansion. Smoke poured from the windows and flames flickered between the roof tiles. A heavy firefight was taking place in the grounds. The figures were difficult to make out in the smoke, but the BA troops who had invaded her home seemed to be forcing their way out. The flash of pulse bolts was strongest around the open double doors of the front entrance. A deep rumble sounded overhead like thunder heralding a storm. No! The person who had hurt her could not be allowed to get away. No one could defile her body and live. The rumble grew louder until she seemed to feel its vibration pass through her. A shape darted above, casting her momentarily into shadow, and heated air blasted down. The BA soldier's ship was returning to take them to safety. She struggled to move despite the pain. Please, Dweer, you must remain still. Frustration and rage gnawing at her, she had no choice except to watch as her soldiers fell to the bolts spurting from the ship's guns. Then the vessel landed, and the BA troops firing intensified, compelling her own to remain behind cover. As the ship's ramp extended, some of the enemy ran from the house and created two straggly lines. Between them, their wounded were helped or carried to the vessel, followed by others who had waited inside. Her soldiers attacked and hit some of the troops in the lines, but if one fell, another took his place. Finally, the defenders broke and ran for the ship. In less than a couple of minutes, they were all aboard. The ramp retracted and the vessel leapt into the sky with a deafening roar. Soon, all that was left was scorched earth, a burning mansion and her own defeated troops. The hands holding her upper body upright carefully lowered her to the stretcher. Carla let out a cry but it was not due to the agony of her burns. Fury and a dreadful sense of impotence battled within her. Never had she been so outraged or felt so powerless. We'll take you to the treatment centre now, Dweer. They can give you something to help you sleep while we tend to your injuries. Carla didn't reply. As her stretcher was lifted and she was borne from the scene, her mind was already elsewhere. Before the BA had merely been an annoyance that stood in the way of her plans and that had happened to harbour the individual who posed a threat to the EAC. Now it harboured someone else, someone who had actively harmed her person, violating the sanctity of her being. The Britannic Alliance had become an object of her deepest hatred. 
she would not rest until every last member of it was crushed and the one who had hurt her was made to pay for the crime. The deaths of Hennessy and Montague would be sweet bliss in comparison. Chapter 45 In a strange twist of circumstances, it had been the AP who had come to their rescue, Taylor discovered when she woke up later in the sick bay once again. Their battleships had successfully held off the EAC attack on the Valiant, allowing the Cornflower to return to her safely and both vessels to escape. And though the mission had failed in that they hadn't captured or killed Dwyer Orr or taken back Jamaica, the rumour was BA Space Fleet was reconsidering its decision to secede. There was a chance it would try to oust the EAC from the Caribbean and re-establish a strong foothold for the Alliance on Earth. It was as if the effect of Arthur's speech was spreading. She didn't remember any of the retreat from the Dweer's mansion. As soon as the medic had seen her wounds, he'd dosed her to the eyeballs. After that, the first thing she remembered was the sick bay doc complaining at her for screwing up all the great surgery she'd done on her back. She learned the spiked rear oar had thrust into her, had pierced her vertebrae and nearly severed her spinal cord. A batcher came to see her every day for a game of Shang-Chi. They spoke of many things, but neither of them mentioned the conversations they'd had while stuck in the desperate situation on Jamaica. Taylor didn't think they would ever speak of it again. Her friend seemed back to his normal self. She thought it was only that he'd become infected with a general malaise of selfishness and apathy that had affected the Britannic Alliance. It was good to see him so regularly, and she was grateful for his visits, but there was someone she also expected to see, who didn't arrive for so long she thought he'd forgotten all about her. Then, one night, after visiting hours were over, he snuck in. The medic was in the office and the other patients ignored him, part of the subterfuge. Hey, said Wright, how are you doing? I would have come before, but I've been busy. Hey, Talon tried to sit up. Do you want some help? He adjusted her pillows and helped to lift her to a more upright position. When she was comfortable and he'd sat down, he said, how are you feeling? Not too doped up on painkillers, I hope. I don't want you turning insubordinate again. Will I be excused if I am? Of course not. I just like to prepare myself. As it happens, I'm not. The doctor is weaning me off them. Then you're in pain? It isn't too bad, honestly. Good. He rubbed the top of his head. What's been happening? she asked. A batcher won't tell me much. He says he doesn't want me to worry about anything. Is there something I should worry about? I wouldn't say so. It's mostly positive news. We seem to have set a good example to the rest of the space fleet, and Colburn says they've realised that becoming an independent entity wasn't very practical. Unless they plan on joining the AP and leaving the solar system, they're always going to rely on Earth for food and energy. Rations won't last them forever. So, it's either make nice with the crazy witch queen, or take back our lands. Talon sighed. Starting with Jamaica, I suppose. I think so, but I don't know for sure yet. His gaze dropped to her necklace. Or it might be the B.I. It is the original homeland. I think Arthur would like that too. Yeah, what's been happening with him? I haven't seen him. Is he okay? He's another one who's been busy. He's a popular guy. Word got out to the other ships about our unusual passenger and now everyone wants to meet him. There's something about him, some sort of, uh, I think it's called charisma. Yeah, that's it. He's got it in bucket loads. Does he still think he's dreaming? He hasn't mentioned it for a while. He might be trying not to think about it. It's going to be hard for him, said Talon, when he finally realises, I mean. His entire world is nothing but ruins and dust, all his family and friends dead and mostly forgotten. His language, his culture, 
all of it just gone. Yes, but he's already learned a new language and made friends. In time, he should be okay. So do you believe me now about who he is? I'm still reserving judgment. Talon rolled her eyes. Does it really matter? Wright went on. Whether he is an ancient king or not, he's changed things around here. That's what counts. She decided she would have to give up on him ever agreeing with her about Arthur. Who are his friends? Well, you for one. He talks about you all the time, telling everyone he meets about an excellent female fighter he knows. I wouldn't be surprised if he offered to make you a knight. And he loves the cat. He takes it everywhere with him. Wright frowned. I didn't know we had a cat aboard. I wonder where it came from. No idea, she replied. And then she yawned. I'm keeping you up, he said. I should go. No, I'm not tired. Don't leave. It's nice to talk. Yeah, beats yelling at each other anyway. But I do need to go. I have reports to write. OK, if you have to. A look passed between them and Talon was reminded of that moment on the cornflower just before they landed in Jamaica. As before, she couldn't guess what he was thinking. Good night then, she said. But the Major was no longer looking at her. He'd become distracted, listening to a comm. He rose halfway to his feet and as he continued to listen, he sat down again. Then his mouth fell open. What is it? asked Talon. Still he didn't reply, paying attention to the message. Suddenly he leapt up and strode quickly away. Major, she called out. What's wrong? Where are you going? Were they about to be attacked by the EAC? Or had the AP switched sides again? She hadn't gotten around to asking him what was happening with them. It's the fearless, he replied, as he left the sick bay. The fearless? What did he mean? Hadn't that been the ship that was swallowed by the mysterious black cloud? He reappeared in the doorway, heading in the opposite direction. She's been found out in the asteroid belt. Then he was gone. The End This has been The Valiant, Star Legend Book One. Written and narrated by J.J. Green, with help from Welsh language consultant Mike Paddock. For more J.J. Green books, visit jjgreenauthor.com.